Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning, kids and cubs, and welcome to season three and episode number 344 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Yeah. Boom. Ha ha. Today, recording day is Friday, March 22nd, 2024. It's Friday. It's Friday. And it is going to be, well, it looks like a little bit of a grayish day here at uh, the Beaver Lodge. In fact, Environment Canada has uh, issued a snowfall warning. Yeah, I saw that earlier. Yes. So we'll see uh, what happens there. But yes, everybody out there, if you, you thought spring was fully, fully here yet and you brought out the patio furniture last weekend, well, as I great, blame you. <laughs> no, no, but as great philosopher Nelson Muntz once said. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. The words of wisdom of Nelson Muntz, the philosophical <laughs> rantings of an animated individual. <laughs> I'm your host, the eager beaver pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver. And with me, as always, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly, who probably either had some very, 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 very hot liquid or something that tasted uh, strong. Oh, very, very strong. strong. <laughs> well, so I was... That'll I was, put some hair on your chest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I started to brew the coffee. So, you know, get up, wake up, do the thing. Computer was acting weird. Had to reboot it. Had to fix it. Okay. Computer's still acting weird. All right. I got to take the dog out. Take the dog out. Come back. And it's minus 18 out there with the wind chill. I got to make the coffee. Feed the dog. Make the coffee. I'm like, I don't have a coffee to start the show. This is not good. I'm not awake yet. So I make a full pot of coffee and I look over and I go, there's enough for a cup. So when you do that, you get the strongest coffee possible because it's. <laughs> so, yeah, it's. Uh... And Vim, uh, Saucy's got it right. We just went through full spring. March yes. is, uh, I mean, it's, we, we've got nine days left in the month, but uh, is it going to go out like a lion? It seems to be. Well, it's supposed to be above zero again by Sunday. So. Okay. Well, it, it came in At like a lion, right? It yes, came in it like a lion. Yes. So I would expect it to lamb out. But, yeah, you know, the weather this year is so unpredictable. I mean, come on. Can't, you know. I mean, pretty much the entire last year. We could have basically gone out at any time of the year and started out with the weather outside is frightful. <laughs> the and the rest of the song changes weather. depending on the season. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. Uh, did I ask how your mental health is doing today, Mr. Grizzly? <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. But uh, <laughs> How's your mental health doing today, my good friend? You know, I think we're doing really good today, actually. Um, I slept like a... A baby, which means I was up four or five times uh, with nightmarish dreams, and uh, not as bad as they have been. Though I uh, had to pee a couple of times, and uh, so then uh, low because Bridget uh, Bridget had to go home last night. Uh, she was having dinner with. What her did son. she do? 
no, no, no. <laughs> she was having dinner with her son, and uh, she said, "I got to get home." I gotta, I'm like, "Hey, hey, go, 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 go. It's fine. I got, I got the puppy dog. She's fine here with me." So you know, I get up. I don't know. It's at five. Get up to go use the toilet at five a.m. when the alarm goes off. I go to crawl back into bed, and and um, what's curled up beside me, but this big old doggy dog. Uh, donut donut her donutine herself right beside my pillow on the cat on the bed and just you know she's got her snout buried but her eyes are looking up at me and the tail is wagging i'm like all right i, I can't be mad at you for that she knows she's not allowed on my bed but I'm, what am i going to do right i can't i can't kick her out for that so yeah and now she's sleeping uh -huh. directly beside me here uh -huh. very cute <laughs> I mean, not only do we have a Lola update, Mr. Grizzly, but we have a jazzy update, Mr. Grizzly. Uh -oh. It seems that Miss Shadika has been very, 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 very happy to report that Jazzy has received her much hoped for admission to the music program at Fanshawe College. Oh, outstanding. Way to, way to, go, way to go, Jazzy. Or Fanshawe, I should say. Fanshawe, Fanshawe yeah. In London. So congratulations. And she's trying out for another musical in town. Uh, they're doing Waitress, which has quickly become an instant classic. Yeah. That, uh, that kind of came out of nowhere, too, right? Because it, it's, yeah. it's not that old. No, no, no. It's not that old at all. I happened to... Oddly enough, I happened 20? to be... It, I don't Maybe. think it's that old. Yeah, I don't. Hey, look, man, the last 24 years have been a bit of a blur. I'll be honest. It's still 1999 in my head somewhere. <laughs> oh, wow. They made a movie of it last year. I didn't even know. Uh, yeah, I know. I knew about that. I haven't seen it. Oh, no, uh, I didn't know at, at all. Hmm. Oh, how interesting. Uh, 2015 was the musical. Oh, so it's, so not, it's not even 10 it's yet. Not even 10. Wow. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I remember it was on, I happened to be in New York that year. Okay. Um, it was the first time I got to see a few things on Broadway and I didn't check out uh, uh, Waitress, unfortunately, because it was new and I didn't really know, know anything about it. Um, but it's uh, the music of Sarah Bareilles. Mm -hmm. She was the composer of the entire musical. But no, I had uh, checked out uh, Evita and uh, Chicago. They had uh, Billy Ray Cyrus playing Billy Flynn in Chicago, and they had Ricky Martin playing Che in Evita. Oh. So that was pretty good. The version of Evita I also saw had the first uh, actual Argentinian-born woman playing Evita on Broadway. It's and the first, eh? Yeah, which was uh, supposed to be a, a really big deal. I don't know how long she stayed. I don't think it was very long because I remember watching the Tony Awards that year, and they announced it, but they played a whole scene uh, from Evita, in which she hardly gets to sing at all <laughs> for some reason. Oh, really? <laughs> it was a whole, yeah, major, uh, major big cast scene. And then when she did sing, it was really interesting because um, she had a lot of vibrato, mm -hmm. like a lot, so and a high, bit of a higher voice. So it just basically sounded like she was like Minnie Mouse on speed. Oh, that's funny. A bit when she was singing those, she was particularly like that on Rainbow High and Caribbean. Rainbow High. <laughs> so, um, Making it was interesting. Yeah, it, it was really weird. Uh, but Ricky Martin was fantastic, and Billy Ray Cyrus was surprisingly good because oh, he was so cute. Because you wouldn't think of a country uh, country singer, known country singer, in a big yeah. you know, Broadway production lead. Now you could tell. Like this, that he was the least experienced on Broadway in the of the whole cast. Yeah. Uh, but you know what? He held his own. I have to say, he held his own. Whatever he did, um, I like it when I hear about artists doing things I don't expect. Yeah. Oh no, I hear you're swimming against you know? the tide, right? Like, yeah. I, I always appreciate that. I think it takes a certain amount of bravado and courage and uh, and uh, commitment to the art. And and you also have to understand too, uh, doing a Broadway play is not an easy thing. Mm -hmm. Eight days you, you a week, eight shows a week. You can't just yell cut. <laughs> yes, a live play is different than a film. And I mean, he's shot, he's done movies, and he's done television, and he's done videos. But there's always a break and a cut. And if you forget your line, and you just yell out line, not in a play. So there's a lot more dedication to that. So I, I appreciate it. <laughs> 
Speaking yep. of speaking of debuts and swimming against the tide, I watched a movie last night on Amazon Prime, uh, Roadhouse, the remake. Right, it's with Jake Gyllenhaal. Yes, or, or the reimagining. And I'm like, the the character name is the same. It's a roadhouse. There's a place in there called the Double Deuce, but it's not the Roadhouse. The Roadhouse is called the Road House. Uh, I enjoyed the film. I did. Uh, and, and the debut was of Conor McGregor, who plays a variation of Conor McGregor. <laughs> but uh, it was a Doug Lyman film, and Doug Lyman is the guy who did um, Go and uh, Swingers. He also okay. did, uh, he did the Bourne, the first two Bourne films. Okay. He did the, uh, what was it, Flight, blah, 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 the one that uh, they crashed in a field in Pennsylvania. Okay, yes. Uh, so Doug Lyman, great filmmaker. And th look, there. if if you do not like hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, and blood and guts and gore, do not watch the film. It is extremely violent. It's supposed to be. That's the point of the film. It's uh, a lot more believable and realistic story than the original. The original was just, I mean, complete fantasy fiction, which was enjoyable. I mean, I still watch that film from time to time because, you know. But this one, you're taking uh, an actual MMA world champion, and he's put on some more muscle for this film. He's not mm -hmm. a big guy. He's like 5'8", I think. Mm -hmm. He could certainly kick my ass because, I mean, you know. Mm -hmm. And he does have sledgehammer fists, and he's got an iron skull. But Jake Gyllenhaal got shredded for this film. I mean, shredded. I don't know what his his uh, workout and diet routine was, but this guy is ripped. Uh, full points to him to, to put the effort in. He probably trained for six months to a year for this role, and mm -hmm. I'm not joking. Now, that would have been a full-time training. He would have had a professional trainer, professional dietitian, yep. nutritionist, all yeah, of that. Just like Samuel Liu when he did his uh, his action movie for Marvel. He said, exactly. You know, and um, the other guy, oh, I forgot his name now. Um, the Ryan Indian Reynolds actor. said the same thing. Oh, yeah. oh, uh, 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 um, oh. No, he's not Indian. He's, he's from Pakistan, actually. Pakistan, sorry, yes. And he got shredded for the, his Marvel role. And I mean, he got shredded. Uh, I can see his face. I can uh, roll. Kumail Nijani. Kumail. Kumail. I knew Kumail his name. Nanjadi. Kumail Nanjadi. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. I feel Nanjiani. bad forgetting his name because I love his work. I think he's a great actor and he's a great oh, comedian. Yeah. He's super funny. I love him. Oh my God. He's hilarious. Have you seen Stuber? No. It's him and Dave Bautista and he's an Uber driver. Kumail's an Uber driver. Oh my. Okay. Yeah. It's good. It's a funny film. All right. He's like, what can I interest in you interest you in some water or some Canadian chocolate? He has coffee crisp. <laughs> <laughs> Canadian uh, chocolate? Coffee crisp. Love it. Love it. <laughs> ah. Sorry, so, I was a little out on a bit of a rant there. Sorry. It's, it's, it's Friday morning. I've got lots of energy. I've got lots of time. Uh, sleeping dog beside me. It's cold outside, but it's warm in here. So yeah. Yeah. It, oh, yeah, Carol, you're right. Zach Efron and Iron Claw, he did the same thing. Zach Efron's always been known for, you know, having abs. Yeah. But he not only has abs in that film, he beefed up. Like, he put, he packed on the muscle for that role. If I don't know if you've seen any clips of it. It's like, no, holy man. shit. Zach Efron's huge. And he's he's not a tall man, but no. he... Uh, he, he, he put the effort in. It's I think it's it's what's more impressive is when you see um wow, I'm blanking on, on names. Wolverine. The okay. actor. Hugh Jackman. Thank you. He's like six foot four. So to put on the muscle that he put on at when your frame is that big, that takes a hell of a lot of work because the muscle fibers are longer. You need to intake more calories, more anyway. Yeah. I'll, I'll get off that topic. <laughs> and maybe we should do some work here. <laughs> All right. Hey, I have no problem talking about muscles. Oh, I <laughs> Just saying. Uh, <laughs> Ooh, okay. Sorry. Um, while I uh, spray myself off here. <laughs> Ooh. Mm. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes. Well, politics is a whole lot less sexy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Uh, but there have been things that have happened. Of course, the big thing, well, the big thing. Uh, 
in the headlines, I guess it's the big thing because it's, you know, made to sound big and dramatic and whatnot. But I mean, in reality, it was a nothing burger. But we did have the confidence vote. The second mm -hmm. one in two days. Now, the first one we had was an actual vote um, to uh, on a motion, conservative presented motion, to not have the carbon tax hike of $15 per ton of CO of carbon emissions right uh go forward on april 1st which will raise uh, the price of carbon by uh, three cents per cubic meter of gas and uh, when i say cubic meter of gas that's not the same thing as gasoline no no gasoline no. needs to be treated or whatnot but basically three cents per 1000 liters of gas Apparently, the conservatives are convinced that this is what is going to absolutely break you and make it so that you can't afford food anymore. And uh, somebody had actually um, suggested, ironically, that the liberals do vote against it for one year. Yes, I did see that. And then that. when nothing changes... Yeah. <laughs> I saw ability. that, and I thought that was interesting. When, when nothing changes and people have less money. Yes. Yes, um, but of course, until people realize that a whole year later, that gives that gives the conservatives one year of runway to say, "See, see, they caved. Why can't they cave on all of it? Why can't they cave on it forever?" Blah blah blah, just like they did with the exemption for home heating fuel. Mm -hmm. So the government wasn't going to do that, but it was a little interesting bit of reverse psychology, I have to say. And it's like, oh yeah, well, let's see how you do. Let's test your little theory here. Um, but the first one. Oh my. Yeah. See, Jake got shredded. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, you I, need I, a moment? Woo! <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I, I couldn't resist because every now and then you, 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 you get me with one that knocks me off my chair. I thought it only best that I do that for you. <laughs> <laughs> Mama. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, no, he, he, he got ripped for this film. Like, absolutely ripped. Uh, there's uh, stories about how he did it, and I'm like, yeah, he put the time in. Yeah. To people listening at home, I had to break out the big gay fan for this one. It was a picture of Jake Gyllenhaal and Conor McGregor, and Jake has uh, Conor in an arm hold. And Connor's trying to get him by the neck, and you can see how shredded they both are. Everything's so. bulging and glistening and wet yeah. and sweaty and <laughs> sorry. Um, different kind of show. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, we had the big vote. The first one was on canceling the increase in the carbon fee, which of course failed. Then yesterday, they decided to go back to the same well and basically just do mm -hmm. straight out confidence motion. We no longer have confidence in you, right? Let's have an election now. Let's have a carbon tax election. And uh, I say we've already had two. The prime minister responded to, uh, to uh, Peter Pop and Fresh Doe in the House of Commons. We've already had three. We won them all. And then which, which Pop and Fresh Doe replied, well, then I guess he'll have no problem having another one. Mm -hmm. Which is like, um... Nobody, it's not the way it works. You don't get to keep on having carbon tax elections until we get, you know, we're a tired, we're tired of him throw the bums out, and then you get to go out and claim claim you won a carbon tax election. Like, yeah. At some point, at some point, it's been voted on and decided. Like this, so you can't keep on saying that every election is going to be a carbon tax election until you actually win one and say, "See, we won a carbon tax election." That's not how it works. It's been voted on three times. Yeah. yeah. As we say back home, calm down. It's just basically calm. You know the pom pom that you have on your toque? Imagine it as a rabbit's tail and it's on your backside. And it's just like, just sit down on that and calm down for a bit. <laughs> All right. All right. So <clears throat> they lost. The vote, uh, which has uh, caused a lot of people to also suggest that we maybe need another change in policy, that if you propose a confidence vote and you lose it, you're the one who should resign. Yeah. 
because right now what's happening is that, uh, and we saw it with the previous government, uh, where um, I think with uh, I think it was with Andrew Shear, maybe not so much with Aaron O'Toole, um, but with Andrew Shear, uh, when they were turning around and saying, "Well, we declare that this is going to be a confidence motion without actually having declared it in the House because it wasn't a motion that they presented." Or they didn't present a confidence motion. Said, but we consider this a confidence motion. And then when they won it, turn around, see, it's a confidence motion. He has to go. It's like, well, no, not if you didn't say it when the vote was happening. And he didn't even show up for the vote. Yes, that's a different thing. That's a different thing. But we're talking about back in the Andrew Shear mm-hmm. days when they would just would declare votes. That was, to us, we consider this a confidence matter. And then they would win those votes and say, see, we have a confidence matter. He needs to step down. It's like, no, you actually have to declare it in the House. So, but right now, now the conservatives are actually presenting things and saying it's a confidence motion. We want an election now. The polls are great for us now. Give us an election now. We deserve to have an election now. What's the matter? You don't want to have an election now? What's the matter? You're scared you can't win? What's the matter? Chew chicken? So they're basically acting like school children. It's like, yeah. They. Trust me. He's a man child. The, the last couple of years of the Harper mandate, when they had their majority year, when we all wanted them to go now, mm-hmm. but we had to wait out the last two years, there was nobody asking for an election every day. No. The nobody election was, was going to come when the election down. was going to come. Nobody yeah. was asking for him to step down. Nobody was asking for an election every day. Ma- matter of fact, the one guy who had the fuck uh, Harper sticker in the rear window of his car got fined $543. I've seen flags parading up and down the streets of my city on the back of pickup trucks, along with rebel flags and American flags and half Canadian, half American flags. And I want to tell each and every one of them to get the fuck out of here. Sorry. Just, just, none of them have received a fine for that. Mm-hmm. Not a one. And they're like, well, because it's, it's F with a maple leaf, CK Trudeau. Oh, okay. Now you're pedantic. <laughs> Now, now, live by the pedantic sword. (laughs) You know you're being pedantic with pedantic people call you out for being pedantic. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah. So, yeah, he straight up lost the vote. And once again, he used our tax dollars, uh, all that we pay to operate the House of Commons and that are supposed to be supposedly spent to uh, run government smoothly as a PR opportunity. Once again, there's going to be lots of fundraising. There's going to be lots of letters. There's going to be, oh my God, I can't believe this. And once again, they're going to say, you know, liberals interfered with that. Uh, You know, you all won an election and those big bad liberals didn't give you one. I guess without mentioning that, so did also not all those big bad NDPers and the big bad Black Labour Quas and those two really, really big, awful bad green MPs. It's like, it's literally, you literally are the cheese who stands alone. Oh, yeah. But you are going to go out, you're going to go out to all your friends, say, oh my God. (laughs) They're so mean. They won't give us an election to make it easier for me to win. (laughs) Because apparently the job of the government these days, according to the conservatives, is to make it easier for the conservatives to accede to government. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just... Uh, apparently the job of a government is to actual commit, to commit political suicide. Well, according to them. Anyway. According to them. So, um, yeah. It, it's just so <sighs> ridiculous. It's absolutely so ridiculous. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, trees that are dying Mm-hmm. so that we can print stories about this thing that really didn't matter. And it's being trumped up. If you're watching the framing, it's like, oh, my God, the liberals survive a confidence motion, the conservatives or whatever. It's like the headline, really, if we were doing honest headline, conservatives waste your time and money. Yeah. yeah. Very much. They declared a confidence motion, and they didn't have the votes in the House to actually win it. Why? They knew they didn't have the votes. It was just a PR stunt. So why? Yeah. You just wasted our money. Just wasted our money. Now, this, as you just uh, put up there, Mr. Grizzly, um, 
was running as counter programming. Well, I can't. We can't really say it's running as counter programming. Mm-hmm. But as you mentioned, Mr. Grizzly. Sorry, before we do move on. Yes, as was the case for Pierre's all night can't stop, won't stop votathon. Mm-hmm. He didn't show when up. he deprived everybody. Yeah, from spending the first day at Hanukkah and their constituencies, even the Jewish MPs, even his own Jewish MPs, while he went out to be to a lighting ceremony to make sure that he was the only elected representative who on the evening of uh, the first night of Hanukkah had a picture of himself with the Jewish community doing something before, of course, going to a four digit fundraiser. Yeah. Well, and had everybody do his voting for him. Well, yesterday, while he was, while everybody was voting on a confidence motion that he himself called for, called for, and couldn't if, show up to vote because he had a fundraiser. Yep. He decided he was going to a fundraiser, an over $1,700 a plate fundraiser. And remember, he cares about two things, money and power, as evidenced by what he does every damn day. No. <sighs> so he once again sent all his minions to do his dirty work for him mm-hmm. while he once again went to a big, big dinner. Hit Tabby G's sale tells us it's $1,725 a plate dinner. Mm, interesting. And basically had everybody vote for him. Now, of course, he remote voted. Yeah, now, remember funny. again, the Conservative Party of Canada is the party that fought tooth and nail to have that. against remote voting. Mm. particularly during the pandemic. They wanted all the MPs to come to a place where a whole bunch of conservative MPs, some of whom were not declaring their vaccination status and some of them that were openly openly supporting a convoy that wanted to eliminate vaccine mandates, they were saying, hey, all other fellow MPs, come into a little closed room with us where we scream and shout. Yeah. To which everybody said, ah, thank you, but I'd rather not. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I would like to think that most of the country, most of the voting populace would see through their duplicitous ways. I would hope. I really do hope that most people can see that. One minute he's calling, where are the vaccines? When are you going to get the vaccines? Get the vaccines here. No more vaccines. What? 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 One minute you're screaming at us because we don't have them. The next minute you're screaming at us to stop them. And now Pierre Polyev's platform if you want to call it that, calls for no ma- no vaccine mandates of any type. Bring it home, measles. Bring it home, mumps. Bring it home, rubella. Bring it home, smallpox. This man is an idiot. Actually, no, I shouldn't say that. He's not an idiot. He's a calculated evil asshole. That he is. That he is. He's a, so, a lying hate monger. And yeah. those, are, those are the words of former Prime Minister Kim Campbell. Yes. So there we go. We have it here on, our, on the Our Commons website. We see that the Honorable, the honorable is doing a lot of heavy lifting there. Heavy Kim lifting. Poliev sponsored this motion that says that the House declared non-confidence in the Prime Minister and his costly government for increasing the carbon tax 23% on April 1st as part of his plan to quadruple the tax while Canadians cannot afford to eat, eat, and house themselves and call for the House to be dissolved so Canadians can vote in a carbon tax election. 116, yay, 204, nays, eight paired votes for a total of 320. The motion is denied. It fails because you are a loser. I had a a group of friends yesterday who were going on and on about, uh, you know, because of this 23% hike on April 1st, let's not buy gas or diesel for a week. I'm like, okay, that's not going to do anything. And, and one of the, one of the individuals said, that's only going to harm the people that work there. The, you know, the, the, the minimum wage earners, it's only going to hurt them. So that doesn't make any sense. And I just added in one simple comment, folks, it's three cents on a liter. They say 23% because that sounds huge. It's three cents on a liter of fuel. I I think you can handle that because gas is still less than a liter of water. Mm -hmm. And scream at a buck 50 for a liter of gas and go in and pay $2.50 for a half a liter of water. And given that the federal government caved 
on the planned increase on alcohol and beer because mm-hmm. the federal government decided that they were going to cap it at 2% again this year instead of the 4 point something percent. If you happen to fill up your gas tank and fill up your own tank, mm-hmm. well, then your taxes are neutral. Yeah. Whatever little more you pay for gas for your car, you're not paying on your beer. So there you go. You got a break. <laughs> you got a break. <laughs> and let's not forget. I know it doesn't work that way, kids. No, I know. Of course not. But let's not forget that you get a rebate. You get back more than you pay into it. And the idea behind this program is to make companies that pollute change their wicked ways so that they don't have to pay the tax. That's how it works. I tried to explain it yesterday. And the other way it works is to make the costs of carbon intensive prices, carbon intensive products more expensive at the purchasing point so that it prompts you to make other choices. Mm Mm-hmm. As simple as that. That's how it's consumer behavior 101. This has been studied scientifically, left, right, and center, up the wazoo. This works. Well, and, and look, we, we're looking at 2030, uh, an end to uh, the combustion engine sales in, in Canada, right? It'll only be uh, electric vehicles after 2030. Okay, fine. Uh, does that work in rural areas right now? No, it doesn't. We know this. That's why we've got like a six year lead time. Well, we can't get enough done in six years. Really? Because, you know, in 2012, if you had said to me, you'd be able to drive across Canada in an electric vehicle, I would have told you you were high off your ass. There's no way you could do it. The infrastructure wasn't there. The charging stations weren't there. There weren't enough vehicles. Batteries just couldn't do it. That's only 12 years ago. You can do it today. You can drive from coast to coast can you drive up north? I don't know about that. And I probably seriously doubt it. I seriously doubt it. I think you could probably drive as far north as Edmonton. And after that, I don't know. Mm. Okay. After that, I don't know. I don't live in that part of the country. I don't have an electric vehicle. I don't have a vehicle, period. So I'm not looking into it. But I do know you can drive across Canada in an electric vehicle because you just plot your route and the GPS tells you where the charging stations are along the way. And that's true. Now, would you want to drive across Canada in an electric vehicle in in the dead of winter? Probably not. We're not there yet. But in six years' time, have you seen how much battery technology has changed in the last decade? Yep. Did you think you would see electric cars in abundance on the streets of Canada like we do today? Because there's a lot of Teslas, Polestars, uh, Nissan Leafs, Chevy Bolts, I see them all over this city. Now, of course, Ottawa is a city that has a very large middle class, mm-hmm. right? Because of yeah. technology, middle and upper class, an upper middle class, because of the tech sector, the federal government, uh, as the, the two largest employers. Tech outweighs the federal government, by the way. There's more employees in, in technology services in Ottawa than there are in the federal government. There's only about 124,000. Sorry about that. Only about 124,000 federal government employees in the city of Ottawa. The next largest employer is the Department of National Defense with civilian employees. Now, technically, it is um, funded by our tax dollars, but Department of National Defense is not a government wing per se. It operates on a different level. There are different rules. They're diff- it's different how it operates. But it's still a federal government, a tech sector, federal government, D&D. And then after that, it's everything else that falls into place in the city of Ottawa. So there are a lot of people here that can afford to purchase an electric vehicle or lease an electric vehicle. I'm not one of them. Will I? Well, my, my lovely partner, uh, Bridget, uh, my wife, We've discussed that in in a few years' time, we are looking at getting an electric SUV because we have this big dog and we're going to be able to transport kayaks and paddle boards and bicycles to areas where we can go and do those things. That's five years away minimum because neither one of us are in a position to make that purchase because an electric SUV (laughs) is a lot more than my Honda Civic was, I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. The time is coming. And when, you know, come 2030, 
when con internal combustion engines are no longer for sale to the general public. There will still be diesel vehicles. Oil is not ending anytime soon. And you'll still be able to buy used cars. You'll still be able to buy used cars. So that's the other thing people seem to forget. Oh, that's it. Come to, they're not building any more roads and we're all going to have to drive electric. There's going to be used cars for sale for decades, okay? It's, it's the alarmists that are going on about ridiculous things. That didn't Michelle Ferrari go on about the roads the other day? No, that was uh, Leslin Lewis who went crazy about roads the other day. Anyway. I've yeah. gone off on a tangent and I've gone off topic and I apologize for that. My mind wanders, especially on a Friday when I've got time, I'm jazzed up. I got an extra strong cup of coffee and we should get back to the topic at hand, which was the non non-confidence vote. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Well, well stated. So yes. So the tax will be going up as scheduled. Skippy has lost his vote. Uh, he will fundraise big time on this there will be no consequence to him for having abused of our tax dollars of our time and of, of the parliamentary system in order to stage this stunt of course um but they're on the record right they're on the record and we're hearing it more and more again uh, people saying if you do not have a climate policy you do not have an economic policy whatsoever and people are asking more and more to get to uh, details on what their climate policy would be because all they have is the, another slogan technology not taxes but uh, this is from the same party that has been promising us since 2006 or 2008 or whatnot that carbon capture and storage was going to do it for us and here we are in 2024 and had we relied on harper's word about carbon capture and storage 18 years ago we would have done absolutely nothing <laughs> all this time so we did need to do something and something was done and this is what's really interesting is that this vote uh, for Pierre Polyev, um, this motion came on the same day that the Canadian Climate Institute released an independent analysis that basically assesses the federal government's climate policies and are they able to significantly reduce Canada's emissions. Mm. Now, this report has concluded that despite the government facing increasing political pressure to halt a planned increase to its consumer carbon tax, it shows that industrial carbon pricing has three times the impact on greenhouse gas emissions as the consumer tax. The report found that carbon pricing, both the consumer and industrial versions together, is projected to reduce emissions by as much as 50% by 2030. So when the conservatives are telling you technology, not taxes, they need to be telling you specifically what suite of technology do they believe is already ready, deployable, and can be put in place by everybody who will need to put it in place in order to achieve 50% reductions by 2030. Because that's what we're doing now with carbon pricing. The consumer one that we have and the industrial one that we don't pay specifically at, mm -hmm. at, at, at price point. Um, now, these things get embedded into the price. I get all of that. But the federal backstop that applies to us as consumers and the ones that applies to the, the, the larger industrial emitters, when you put them together, that counts for 50% of reductions by 2030. If we just keep doing what we're doing, if we just keep doing what we've planned, they've got to be able to tell you what they have that can replace that. Because the technology needs to exist now. We need to be able to put it in place now. And we're probably going to need some government subsidies of some kind to get everybody to put them in place now for them to do what needs to be done uh, within six years. Yeah. There's a, here's a great comment from PNC Bio. It's as though carbon pricing is meant to change behavior through pricing. Where's the uproar on cigarette taxes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Using the tax system to influence behavior. That's why you get incentives when you buy an electric vehicle. Yeah. We're using the tax system to change behavior. That's why Harper tried the boutique tax credit, mm -hmm. which the conservatives want to try and bring back again or something like that for you know health and fitness for your kids. Mm -hmm. hoping, they were hoping that by giving you a little tax credit that more people would register their kids into sports to help with obesity. Of course, 
it didn't because it was basic the, the amount wasn't enough it was not and you had to pay everything up front so if you yeah. didn't have the money to send your kid in the first place you, you couldn't benefit from the tax yeah. yeah yeah exactly so so it was basically a boutique tax cut to the middle to upper class which was his core demographic it's well, just a way of funneling some money their way and then of course when when you hear somebody say but i can't afford to do it up front well then you shouldn't have had kids from the same crowd that is anti-abortion and anti-contraception. Yeah. What the... What the... Yeah. So the can skipping on the record, man. Yeah. So the Canada Climate Institute's report says that industrial carbon pricing is projected to contribute between 23 and 39 percent, or 53 to 93 megatons, of avoided emissions from all policies implemented to date. The report says the consumer carbon price accounts for between 8 and 9 percent, or 9 to 22 megatons of projected emissions reductions. In other words, the industrial carbon price is driving three times the emissions reductions attributed to the consumer carbon price. Executive Vice President of the Canadian Climate Institute, Dale Bugin, said, quote, mm -hmm. unambiguously, the policies that are in place are working and have been working, and industrial carbon pricing is leading the way. It is by far the biggest contributor to emissions reductions. And uh, the CBC article here, Mr. Grizzly, has a bit of a graph mm -hmm. showing uh, Canadians uh, what uh, things contribute. Uh, I'm going to raise this a little bit because mm -hmm. the bar is in the way. But right here, so large emitter trading systems, as you can see, it's one of the big chunks. Mm -hmm. Oil and gas, gas emissions cap, this is the thing that Daniel Smith is fighting tooth and nail against. Mm -hmm. Methane regulations, so those are the three that contribute the most. And then, well, there's some fuel char charges, waste methane capture, which is very, very, very small sliver, clean fuel regulations, investment tax credits, and zero emission of vehicle standards. So when you add all of these together, because mm. that's where the, the report that we saw earlier in the year stating that Canada, if all their planned uh, projects go through, would be able to meet the targets that they set. Because for the last two years, that committee kept on issuing reports saying that we're not there yet. And the federal right. government kept on saying, no, hold on, hold on. Not our, not everything that we have, we have planned has been announced yet. Not everything's in place. But when it, when it does, it will. A lot of people said, no, it won't, no, it won't. And then last year, or earlier this year, sorry, or late last year, for the first time, we had one of those reports that said, you know what? We actually might be on the right track here. Funny that, eh? So, wow. You can't do it all at once. You had to do it piece by piece in little pieces, and you had to do it in a smart way. And it seems that this federal government has done it. And as we mentioned last Friday, when we had Keith Stewart on the show, I asked him objectively, because he's with Greenpeace, mm -hmm. right? It's like, are we actually doing better under this current government? And while Greenpeace is not going to say that we're doing perfect, because far from it, yes, he did, and it didn't take him long to say it either. It's not like he had it was he was torn about it. No, no, said, yeah, no, we are doing better objectively. So um, we're on the right track right now, and the conservatives do not want this. Now, the Funny Climate Institute, works, yeah. The Climate Institute warns us against seeing this analysis as license to drop the consumer price and maintain carbon pricing for big polluters. Quote, our analysis suggests that all the policies that we have, if we implement everything in the pipeline, we're still going to be just shy. So lose, losing any of those pieces does make the job of achieving those targets even harder. Um, the Canadian Climate Institute analysis shows that Canada is on track to meet up to 90% of its 2030 emissions target of 400 megatons or less. So we still got a little bit more to do in order to reach it. But 90% of the way there is way further than a lot of people said that we were ever going to get when we started. Oh, yeah. Especially all the people that said, oh, don't even bother trying. It's not worth it. It's never going to work. Sky is falling. It's not going to work. We can't do it. We can't. <laughs> we tried it for all of 15 seconds. It hasn't worked yet. Scrap it. You're wasting our time. We've tried nothing, man, and we're all out of ideas. Mm -hmm. According to the report, although Canada's emissions ticked up slightly last year, the economy has been on a downward emissions trajectory since 2005. Mm. In 2021, the latest year for emissions reporting, Canada's greenhouse gases stood at 670 megatons. Canada's national carbon pricing system has, becoming, has become increasingly politicized, of course, as you mentioned. Mm. And uh, as we mentioned, and that's uh, why Pierre Polliver is trying to take this away. So he's trying to basically kill it now. And I think this is one of the reasons why he's making such a big deal of it. Because I think if we go another four or five years, that's a... 
Prime Minister Trudeau happens to win another term and we go another mm-hmm. four years with this, we'll see how close we are. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To have reached those 20, 30 targets. And then all of a sudden, it's going to be a good news story rather than a bad news story oh, wouldn't, for wouldn't the government that, of the day. Wouldn't that just piss off a lot of people, right? Yeah. So it's one of those reasons. It's, it's similar to the United States where they really wanted to try and kill Obamacare like in the first two years after it was... Yes, we need to do it in the first two years. We need to do it really, really in the the first four because after that, people are going to get used to it and they're going to kind of like it. We can't have that. Mm. That was the GOP's position. Well, they failed. And now people actually really like it. And uh, now them wanting to do anything to try to attack it in one way is now a vote loser rather than a vote getter. But there was a time for a while when they were doing all the gaslighting and filling the airwaves and you know, flooding the zone with BS, where most people believe that it was, that Obamacare was terrible for them. Well, Until and, and they started say, needing it. Yeah. Different story then, right? Yeah. So same thing here. In about four, you know, four years from election day, if you happen to get another term, everybody's going to see. We're going to have all these groovy graphics showing how we've really started to bend the curb and we're getting close to that target and whatnot, and everybody's going to be turning around. And the narrative on that's going to be going, see? See when we all pulled together? We did it for acid rain. We did it for repairing the ozone layer, and we're going to do it for GHG reductions. Who's with me? Yay! This, this. But right yeah. now, we're, we're on that tipping point curve where we can go one way or the other. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, absolutely. The conservatives are doing everything to push us the wrong way. Of course they are. So it is working. It is working. Yeah, you got Carol DeLorenzi here, Kit Carol saying, someone said the liberals are oddly confident. To me, they've got an ace waiting for it now. And that's the other way as well, where people were saying, well, if the conservatives have it in the bag, why do they want an election right, right, right now? What's the thing? What is it that they know about themselves that they don't want coming out over the next few years? And, um, well, one of those things might have to do, well, there's two things going on, uh, actually. The first thing is that, remember that um, Trans Mountain Pipeline? Mm-hmm. Remember that pipeline to Tidewater that uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan told us was absolutely vital and that Stephen Harper told us was absolutely vital, so vital that we had to gut environmental legislation left, right, and center, including the Waterways Act, to make it so that he could build that pipeline that he did not get one inch built in 10 years. And then we had the prime minister, the current prime minister, who, um, as he mentioned on Ryan Jefferson, Jesperson, uh, took a couple of punches right in the teeth for having supported bringing a pipeline to Tidewater because this prime minister who's governing for all Canadians, not just certain factor factors, realized that if we are going to be pumping oil out for the next 20 to 30 years, at least, it's probably a good idea for us to get the best price possible for it. Only makes sense. And to do that, we're going to need a pipeline to Tidewater. Now, of course, the pipeline, as all government infrastructure projects do, went over budget, and it seems that it's going to come in at about $34 billion rather than what was promised at first, which I think was like 9 or 12 or something. Um, Mm -hmm. not quite sure, uh, off the top of my head. Um, but we are going to have a pipeline to tie water. And yesterday, um, it was announced that TMX is actually having oil pumped into the pipeline. Yeah. As of yesterday, starting as of yesterday, it's starting to be loaded with oil and that the first shipment will probably be delivered on or around Canada Day, probably just a little bit before. Uh, oddly enough, uh, Daniel Smith is not running to the press and calling the Prime Minister this and that and the other thing for getting it done. Now, you will note here that even with the challenge of COVID, that this Prime Minister will have gotten done within eight years, seven really, that which the present, the previous government could manage to get one inch of progress done in in a decade. Uh, now, apparently, as well, um, because people can't just say, hey, this is a great thing, this is great, thank you so much. Uh, they're, of course, saying, well, of course we could have had more pipelines had Trudeau not cancelled all the other ones. I don't, I don't, I don't, 
I, I just don't. They I, just I can't be grateful, I, can you? You just can't yeah. be grateful, can you? I guess. And yeah. the, the one, I don't can't remember which one, the name of the one it was that was going to go down the states through Texas, um, Biden canceled that one. Yeah, he did. That's right. Biden that was, that which one. which one was that? I can't remember, but that was a Biden cancellation, correct? Yes, yes. We had Energy East, which mm -hmm. you know, basically Quebec said, "Not over our territory." Thank not you happening. very much. That not happening. Like this, and then I think Line Nine is it? Was was it called or something? I think it was Line Nine, but there was another yeah. name for it. I just can't remember. What yeah, I think it was. Yeah, I can't remember which one it was. Uh, and that one, yes, was going to be going down to going down to Texas, where they were going. We were basically just going to pull it out of the ground and put it in a pipeline and let somebody else transform it for us, where we could buy it back at three times the price, or ten times the price, or however it is. Keystone, thank you, Keystone XL, thank you, Kid Jim. That's right. Yes, and uh, Northern Ontario said no to Energy East as well. Yes, right. absolutely. So, um, yeah. So basically, they were projects that were non-starters. But this one is going all the way through. And um, so $34 billion transmitting pipeline. Uh, let's see what it says. The first export shipment will happen before Canada Day, the Federal Crown Corporation said, although Alberta's premiers expect it could be operational as soon as May. The Trans Mountain is Canada's only oil pipeline to the West Coast. The project will transport oil from Alberta to the West Coast and triple the amount of crude that is shipped on an existing pipeline from 300,000 barrels a day to 890,000 barrels per day. And that's how Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is, according to Daniel Smith, trying to kill the oil sector uh -huh. <laughs> by tripling its capacity to export. Yeah, that's, that's what a true. bastard. What an asshole. Oh, geez. Canadian oil prices are expected to increase once the new project is completed. So oil prices and, 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 and other, what they mean is the amount of money we get for our oil here. Court challenges, regulatory hurdles, multiple protests, and constant delays are all part of the history of the project, which began more than a decade ago. Then there's the cost. There we go. The estimated original price tag was $7.4 billion. Today, expenses are $34 billion. And as the Prime Minister mentioned, there's a plan to sell it uh, to a consortium, probably, that will include Indigenous groups. And yes, we will not be able to sell it for cost or for a profit, because as the Prime Minister mentioned on Ryan Jesperson's show, his goal was not to make a profit on it. His goal was to make sure that there was an avenue for which uh, we, as a nation, can get maximum price for our oil. Right. There you go. And given that it's such a large asset, the government should not be holding the asset, but the government did use the special powers that it has because there are certain things that only governments can do. Because, for example, the government can go to a bank and say, you know what, my lifespan, the lifespan of our country is probably going to be more than 82 years, which is the lifespan of an average human. So you can give me a $34 billion loan that we could pay back over 100 years instead of over 20. That's reasonable. So... We're going to use our power as a government because there are certain things that only government can do, and we're going to put it to the use of the nation on a large, large capital infrastructure project such as this. Reasonable. Reasonable. So, um, yes, it's going to be loaded with oil. It's ready to go. Uh, no premiers are really upset about it. And uh, I'm sure that we're going to get, um, as the money starts coming in, a lot of disgruntled and scornful, gee, we made money on selling oil. We made more money than we would have otherwise. Thanks, Trudeau. <laughs> you prick. <laughs> Getting accomplished what it is we couldn't do. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. 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 Yeah. Asshole. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> ah, our lady of the perpetually dissatisfied. <laughs> so, yes, and of course, oil production right now in Canada has never been higher. Yeah. So uh, uh, another way that our prime minister is trying to kneecap the sector. He's really doing a terrible job of it. You think? I mean, if that was his stated mission all the way about that and coming for all your guns. <laughs> the thing and that totally, isn't happening. And totally censoring your internet. Yeah, the thing that isn't happening. That, that yeah, thing. because you're not allowed to say any of the things that you were saying three years ago anymore, apparently. 
apparently. Apparently. I still see plenty of it, though. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know exactly what happened to that. I was looking for, if it was true, I was looking for it for a little, a little piece on my timeline. But uh, yeah, that did not happen. Oh, well. <laughs> so yes, it is being done. And uh, yes, I know that it seems contrary. Uh, the federal government does have an official policy that uh, any uh, increased royalties that the federal government receives as a result of the TMX pipeline will be invested into carbon reduction projects. That was the deal they made with us when uh, they put our money in in order to get the project completed to backstop the project. So uh, now we, we're going to need to see that part happen. So everybody else uh, on the uh, pro-environment sector needs to keep their eyes peeled to make sure that they get the government account accountability specifically uh, with regard to reinvesting the royalty revenues from this project into carbon reduction uh, initiatives. Imagine so, that. Yeah. Well, you know, if they actually do follow through on it, mm -hmm. because it's easy to get tempted by the money and decide, oh, we have another need. So if they actually do follow through on it from beginning to end the, with their project, um, this will be a win-win-win. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it'll be a win-win-win. Now, I know that for the set, for the, the group of people who believe that we need to just leave it all on the ground right now and stop pumping it and all that, while technically you may be correct that, yes, it would be better off if we just did leave it in the ground, um, given that we didn't do the work of adapting as fast as we needed to. <laughs> well, there may, yeah. there, there may, there may be some consequences, uh, to that as well. That might be a little less, uh, desirable. Um, but if we are taking the approach that the government has to govern for absolutely everybody, this and has to make sure it does not have the option of just stopping the world from spinning on a dime and let gravity pull a whole bunch of people right off the planet. Um, that's not a good scenario. Yeah. Then, you know, this might be your best case, a way to transition out and away from one, make sure that people transition employment wise to greener industries or to the industries of the future. And at the same time, making sure that, uh, money that is, uh, generated from this particular initiative goes into the primary objective which is um, loosening or lessening our reliance on fossil fuels in order to uh, provide ourselves with energy and heat and everything else that uh, we need uh, to be a country on the go. There you go. Pretty simple, but right? It seemed, but we're at the point now where we're seeing a lot of the elements of the plan start to come together. And this is one of the reasons for which it's probably very important for this prime minister to get another term so he can consolidate those, gain, those gains once he has all those elements of the system working together for three or four years. And everybody can see what it generates when you put it all together. Yep, Kitlin M. If we'd started climate mitigation 40 years ago when we should have, leaving it in the ground would be an option. But we did it, and it's not. Yeah, exactly. It would also be a whole lot less expensive than it is now. A lot less expensive. Yeah. Because we would have done part of the work before all of a sudden we realized, yeah, no, it's been 20 years that we've been saying, you know what, we should get on this. And we said, yeah, we're just going to leave it to the next guy. Well, well uh, the guy that's the, currently there is basically saying, I can't leave it to the next guy. And this is the thing that's been occurring in this country for a century. Uh, well, if, if, I, if, we, if we institute this, people are going to get mad and vote us out. Yeah, well, guess what? Your job is to do the right thing. Yep. I'll That's give you a got, small, for instance, in this city. Sorry. That's how we got those things like, for example, the growing pension obligations. Yes. I'll we'll leave it to the next side. Or governments that didn't raise university tuition the 1% or 2% a year when it needed to. And all of a sudden, oh, my God, we need to raise university tuition 20%. We're going to do it all in one year. Boom. And then they get the protests from mm -hmm. the students, right? So you got you to gotta maintain the place, man. <laughs> Sorry, I cut you off. No, it's fine. It's fine. It's, so I think most people in this country have probably heard about Ottawa's LRT and the issues we've had with the LRT, right? Oy vey. And they're ongoing. Now, we're happy to have it. I use it frequently. I love it. 
it's got its issues and they are a plenty. They are slowly working them out and the new line should be ready in a year or so. They're behind schedule by a year. One of them is back in 1988, the then mayor, Jim Durrell, Jim Durrell, uh, proposed, Durrell, yeah. proposed to build a tunnel through the downtown core that we have right now. And mm -hmm. it was going to be for buses as part of the transitway. Cause you remember the transitway back then, yep. sir. Yes. Um, that was great. It, it was a, a separate line on the street where only buses could drive. The problem was they come to intersections and when it was first instituted, it was fine. But as time went on, it got worse and worse and worse. And, and about a year to two years before the LRT opened, it looked like a train of buses. Like literally you could get on a bus and wait for 30 to 40 minutes before you would move. Hmm. That wasn't a joke. When they first proposed the tunnel back in 87 or 88, uh, it would have cost $450 million to build and it would have saved eight minutes in commute time then. And everybody said, well, that's ridiculous. And they, that's a ridiculous expenditure for eight minutes. That's not worth the time. And his take on it was, but we're not building it for today. We're building it for 20 or 30 years from now when the city will have grown exponentially like it did. And guess what happened? They put it off and put it off and ignored it. And then tr you had a literally a train of buses spewing diesel smoke into the air for at least 15 years, if not longer. And those of us who live in downtown Ottawa will remember that train of buses. Oh yeah. A shower in the morning and in the afternoon. Yep. And it literally was a train. Yep. It could be 1.5 kilometers of buses. Yep. The entire transit way through the core. So they ignored it and said, we can't do this. It actually brought his government down. Yep. He did not get reelected because he was really pushing for it, as was, I think, um, Andrew Hayden. He was mm -hmm. also pushing through it. Andrew Hayden was a very visionary counselor. Mm -hmm. He's a good man. They have a park named after him. He had a lot of visionary ideas for this city. And at the time, they wanted to build a transit tunnel for the transit way for buses only. And that would have been fine and it would have been good. And they said, look, we could even put rails down in the future. We'll build it so it yep. can handle light rail if we need to. But they ignored it and said $450 million. Well, $3 billion later. Yep. And we're still having problems with it. Build now for the future. Have you seen what they're doing in Paris, France? They're spending $63 billion to build a 200 kilometer track. Buried the whole thing. It encircles all of Paris. It's called the Paris Express. It will get cars off the road because they want to reduce uh, vehicles by 50% and, and increase green space up to 50% by 2030. There's only about 8% in Paris with green space. Right. You've been to Paris. I've been yep. to Paris. Many of the, the viewers and listeners have been to Paris. It's a beautiful city and it's trying to continue to beautify itself. It's costing $63 billion to build something that is necessary. And Parisians and, and, and French were going, no, we, we need to do this. You will never recover the investment on a subway or a public infrastructure uh, of a transit system. It's never going to be recovered. But it doesn't matter. You build it because it's the right thing to do for the future, for the planet, for the next several generations. You're never going to make money on it. It's not supposed to be a money maker. It's not a for-profit venture. It's not supposed to be. No city that has ever built a public infrastructure transit system anywhere in the world regrets it, knowing that they lost money. Well, Ottawa might be a different case in that instance, but most international cities do not regret it because it's necessary. It's necessary to move people. It's necessary for the public. It's necessary for the planet. And it can be done if you have people who are willing to put their neck out there and say, you know what? I will not get reelected if I do this, but I don't care. I didn't get elected to make this my career. I got elected to make a difference. I got into office to make a difference for myself, for my neighbors, for my community, for the future, for my children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. Now, I don't personally have any of them myself, but I'm still going to do things for those folks that aren't mine. That is why you get into public office to serve the public for the greater good, not to make it a career like Pierre. Polyev has. Yep. That's fired exactly a it. What? I fired a salvo. He does not believe in the public good. He believes in his wallet. 
that's it. Yeah, pretty much. He it. said himself when he first got into politics, it should not be a lifelong career. It should be four to eight years and then out. Twenty well, years 12 later, years, you're twelve years past your due date, Pierre. Time for you to go. Vingt ans plus tard. Honor your own <laughs> words, you spineless jellyfish. Honor your own damn words and leave. It's funny that you mentioned spineless jellyfish because I'm thinking of the SpongeBob thing. It's like 20 years later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so the first thing Pierre does not have going on his side is the fact that the Trans Mountain Pipeline is being filled with oil and will be delivering oil. Yeah, it started. Was, it did start yesterday, correct? Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. And we'll be delivering oil before July 1st um, because, you know, that's not good for conservatives to have a liberal succeed where the conservatives failed spectacularly. And it's not like we all didn't see it happen. The other thing, however, is remember um, that thing that I mentioned a while ago about uh, Pierre Podiev and lobbyists oh yes, yes yes he says he doesn't like them he considered them useless and then oh, uh, according boy. to breach media uh, we found out that uh, nearly half of the conservatives new governing body go, new governing body were lobbyists for oil pharma real estate and anti-union companies according to an investigation by the breach on september 11th 2023 uh, i mentioned this last week and said i wanted to read it into the record and i will hear Please. because it leads up to something else here. Um, so this was written by someone named Martin Lukacs, or Lukacs. Lobbyists for major remember. oil, yes. Lobbyists for major oil, pharmaceutical, real estate, and anti-union companies were elected to nearly half of the seats on the Conservative Party's top governing body at its convention in Quebec City. Those elected don't exactly represent the interests of, quote, common people, whom conservative leader Pierre Polyev has said he's championing in speeches and ads rolled out in the past months. In a keynote addressed on Friday, Poiliev evoked the life of a single mother on minimum wage and the struggles of a farmer, electrician, and young couple feeling like, quote, strangers in their own country. That was the speech where he talked about the paycheck in one hand and the cold beverage in the other while you're sitting on your porch with the flag gently waving in the wind. And well, I think you're saying, oh, we the are paycheck home. paycheck in one hand because when he reiterated it recently, he just said, he didn't say paycheck in a hand. Yeah, just only the drink this time. Yes, yes. He, so he basically stole your paycheck. He stole your paycheck. In his speech. Just saying. <laughs> oh, he somebody's axed, gonna get mad at He that. axed your paycheck. Yeah, yeah. He, he axed your he axed your check. <laughs> but despite his extensive efforts to rebrand the party as a defender of ordinary people, the lobbyists now on the National Council are a reflection of the Conservatives' powerful traditional corporate backers. They include Amber Ruddy, a lobbyist for oil companies like Tourmaline Oil Corporation and Husky, several pharmaceutical giants including GlaxoSmithKline and Merit, the Construction Association which pushes governments to pass anti-union policies. Ruddy has also been registered to lobby for the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, the country's loudest opponent of wage increases for workers and a pretty much useless organization, to be totally honest here. Right up there with the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. I don't actually know exactly who they represent and who's a member. Mm. And they're not particularly forthcoming on it. No goodness, no. Well, at least the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. I don't know if anybody's asked the Canadian Federation of Business to ask who their sponsors are and all that kind of stuff. She previously worked for the Federation as a director. Another newly elected council member is Heather Feldbush, a former staffer for Alberta's United Conservative Party. According to the Alberta Lobbyist Registry, she has lobbied for oil companies like Enbridge Real Estate Manager Avenue Commercial and aviation and real estate investment firm Westerkirk Capital, which is owned by one of the country's richest billionaires, Sherry Brideson. The other three council members currently or previously worked for Capitol Hill Group, a major Canadian firm that lobbies for Amazon big tech security and financial companies, as well as the Canadian Federation of Apartment Associations, the country's largest private housing industry group that has opposed capping rent increases. Many of these same corporations have made record profits in recent years, hiking up prices, driving up inflation, and making life more unaffordable for the, quote, ordinary people that Pelyev has said his party will help. The volunteer-based National Council is the party's highest and most powerful authority on nomination races and other election readiness and government matters. Sorry, governance matters. The day before the council's election at the convention, conservative members voted down a resolution calling for lobbyists to be barred from serving on the 20-member governing body in a policy session off-limits to the media. 
The Hill Times reported that some of the writing associations who sponsored the resolution had set up an anonymous website, no sorry, no lobbyists on cancel.ca, to campaign against the lobbyists running in the election. Members of National Council are supposed to represent the members of our party and work with MPs and members of caucus to help us win the election, the site read. But lobbyists are meeting with MPs to represent their corporate clients. How can we ever call out the liberals if we are guilty of perceived conflicts of interests in ourselves? And I remember uh, somebody had pointed out that a couple of days before Pierre Polyev mentioned something about lobbyists being useless, that he had mm-hmm. met with them 98 times in the previous 30 days. He's talking out of both sides of his mouth. Yes. A few hours after the election results were announced on Saturday afternoon, the website disappeared. Its content creators did not reply to a request for comment. So no lobbyists on council.ca disappeared a few seconds. A few hours, sorry, after the election results were announced, after he became leader. Remember that. Okay, put a pin in that. A whole website disappeared just hours after him being elected leader because that quite that type of quick action will come in handy with where, where this is leading according to the breaches investigation at least seven of the 20 new national law council members are now corporate lobbyists there's also a real estate agent two investment bankers several corporate lawyers a sales director at a company that caters private jets to wealthy clients something that quote common people will unlikely be partaking to in any time soon and a partridge in a pear tree it just gets better by the second doesn't it Yes. Despite Polyev's rebukes of, quote, gatekeepers and, quote, the elite, the uh-huh. composition of his party's National Council closely mirrors the corporate interests the party has traditionally represented. Those interests are dominated by resource companies, small and mid-sized oil producers, construction and real estate developers, and medium-sized businesses and retail giants that fight unions and higher wages much more aggressively than the larger corporations that tend to gravitate towards the Liberal Party. These corporate players will be looking to a Podiev government for the sorts of policies Stephen Harper's conservatives implemented, slashing corporate taxes, undermining labor rights, limiting access to social assistance, scrapping environmental regulations, and furthering economic and military integration with the United States. Hardly the policies that would serve the working Canadians, Podiev described in his convention speech. Yep. So, yesterday... It came out in the Globe and Mail. Now, again, remember a couple weeks ago when we talked about don't be fooled by the rocks that I got? I'm still, I'm still still Jenny from La Blas. Yeah. And we found out that Jenny Burns, who's his um, basically chief staffer, conservative strategist, and basically the woman who runs Pierre Polyev's show, has a public relations firm called Jenny Byrne and Associates. And Jenny Byrne and Associates had six various lobbyists working in some capacity on the Loblaws file. And she said, well, you know, I, I only work at the provincial level and, you know, it's not the same. Liberals in the freezers. And, well, yeah. Yeah. well basically... She's earning money from the lobbying stuff because the money comes into Jenny Burns' firm. Now, even though she's not doing the lobbying herself, it's six of her employees. Um, she's they don't get they, they, they don't get to keep one hundred percent of the the money they bill. No, no, of course not. Some of that money goes to Jenny Burns and Associates, yeah. a firm that bears her name, even though she's only a minority shareholder. It's her name. Yeah. Well, yes, they're they're trading on her name. It's Jenny Byrne. She won the first minor, first majority for a conservative prime minister since Brian Mulroney. Yeah. That's how they're marketing her as. So, so they're using her name, even though she's a minority shareholder. And they were basically still somewhat affiliated with Loblaws during this entire time that we've been talking about affordability crisis and grocers potentially gouging Canadians and high food inflation. Well, according to the Globe and Mail's Marika Walsh, now, remember when I said a few hours mm-hmm. after Pierre becoming leader, the website disappeared? No lobbyists yeah. on council? On the first business day after Pierre Polyev's election as a conservative leader, the senior staff of a lobbying firm run by his top advisor established a second company housed out of the same office with many of the same staff. 
but dropping the name Jenny Byrne. Nervis Byrne is one of the most powerful conservative operatives in the country. She attends conservative caucus meetings and is directly involved in the party's strategy and election planning. She is also CEO and minority shareholder of Jenny Burns & Associates, a government and public relations firm. But on the Monday after Mr. Polyev's September 10th, 2022 leadership win. So this has been the case for about a year and a half now, mm. Kids and Cubs. And we're finding all about it now. We're only finding about it now. But on the Monday after Mr. Polyev's September 10th, 2022 leadership win, the president and senior vice president of Jenny Burnin Associates incorporated Forchek strategies. Love the hockey. Foreskin strategy. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. Love the hockey related the name there, eh? Yeah, yeah, of course it is. Forchek strategies because we've got a real folksy Canadian here. Mm -hmm. Many of the staff who work at Miss Burns' firm also lobby federally for Forchek. Clients who booked meetings on Forcheck's websites were redirected to the booking system for Jenny Byrne and Associates. That function was removed, as was Mrs. Burns, Miss Burns' headshot posted to the website after the Globe's inquiries about the connection between the two firms. Duplicity. So it wasn't until the Globe and Mail started calling them and saying, uh, what's this Forcheck thing and why is Jenny Burns' photo on it and why is it when we want to book an appointment it brings us to Jenny Burns' site that they turn around and go, oops, woo, we need to fix that. But that's been up for a year and a half now. So we're expected to believe that for a whole year and a half, oh, we, 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 we had no idea that the reservation system linked to the old company's reservation system and that we were still using her picture even though we dropped her name. Oopsie, we didn't mean to get caught with our hand in the cookie jar. It's basically what they said. Yeah, yeah. Unimpressed. You know what face this is, Mr. Grizzly? Yes. Yeah. My unimpressed face. It's like, I know I see you peeing on my leg. Do not tell me it is raining. I see no, that the pee know. is yellow. I see that the rain is yellow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, this is cute. This is cute. Look at this comment from Dayton Spink. Waiting for Pierre to clean sweep this election. Okay, Dayton. Let us know how that's going to happen. No, I'm not picking on you. Like... And please, nobody pick on him, this person. Don't pick on this person. I want to know how you think that's going to happen. All right. Continuing right. on. Legitimately. All right. The Conservative Party did not respond to the Globe's request for comment. In a brief statement, Mr. Polyev's office only said Miss Byrne is not paid by Mr. Polyev's office. Uh, that was the question that was asked. No clarity was given if she is paid by the Conservative Party, though. In email statements to the Globe, the companies did not address the many overlaps between the two firms, including how the dual roles of staff working at both companies are kept separate. They also did not answer the Globe's questions about whether they had consulted to the lobbying, consulted the lobbying commissioner prior to establishing the separate firms. I'm going to guess the answers to both those questions are no. Sorry, the first question would be nothing. We did nothing to address the many overlaps. And no, we did not ask the lobbying commissioner prior to establishing the separate firm. That's why we kept her name on it, kept it link going to Jenny Byrne and Associates. Because we definitely asked the commissioner whether or not it was okay. Mm -hmm. Wink. No, they didn't. No, they yeah. didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In brief statements to the Globe, Miss Byrne stressed that her firm only lobbies provincially. I have no role in Forcheck strategies in any capacity, she said. I have not received financial compensation from Forcheck. I do not speak to clients or do business development. I just allowed them to use my booking system in my name, in my picture. Mm -hmm. Sorry, not my name. The president and senior vice president of Jenny Byrne and Associates, Andrew Kimber and Simon Jeffries, hold the same titles at Forcheck and are the registered directors. Both firms are provincially incorporated at the same address as Mr. Kimber is also director of Miss Byrne's firm. So here's the thing, Miss Byrne. If you have no role in Forcheck strategies in any capacity and you've not received any financial compensation for Forcheck and you do not speak to clients or do business development, did you give the two employees of Jenny Byrne and Associates who work for you explicit permission for them to use the same address as your business to incorporate for check strategies or did they do this behind your back and if they did do this behind your back why are they still working for you oh <gasps> some inconvenient questions mm. mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. In a statement, Mr. Kimber said that given Ms. Burns' political work, they sought legal advice, quote, in order to avoid even the appearance of a conflict of interest with their federal work. As a result, he and Mr. Jeffries established four check strategies, which he said, quote, is its own entity. Well, Mr. Kimber, you, I'm sure, if you have done this, would be happy to tell us from whom you sought such legal advice. Oh, oops. For inconvenient questions. He said Miss Byrne is not involved in forecheck and her photo was uploaded in error. Mm -hmm. That's a lie. Yeah. Yeah, uploaded in error. Because I feel like Maury Povich. You, you did all this work pre him being chosen leader to know that you would have to set up a new company the first business day after we him becoming you didn't let that wait for a while or you didn't wake up after so oh my god become a leader maybe we should do that you actually knew that and planned that before so that you had it ready to go the next day this but you didn't do the work of making sure you just didn't transfer her picture or her booking software from the site that you already have when you copied the site I'd like to address this comment from Cassie, and yeah. I, I, I agree. I agree with you, Cassie. I do, and it it, it is concern. Uh, I'm not underestimating that people's fatigue for Trudeau will outweigh disdain for Pierre Polyev or just voters' fatigue with current political climate and stay home. And that is a huge concern for all of us, yes. for every Canadian, because when people give up on democracy, what happens after that? Fas fascism and then dictatorship. We can't give up on democracy and we need to lobby our MPs to bring in mandatory voting and put an incentive in a tax rebate, something, but mandatory voting like they have in Australia is needed. The new voting system that'll be in place for the following election, not the next one, three days, you can vote at any place. That is good for democracy, and the conservatives hate it. They hate yeah, it. They hate it because it's higher turnout, and higher turnout doesn't favor them. No, it doesn't. They want to do everything to restrict your ability to get in and cast your right. Because it's your right in this country to vote. My grandfather used to say it's a privilege to vote, and I'm like, no, no, grandfather, it's not. In Canada, it's a right, a guaranteed right. Some countries see it as a privilege. In this country, it is your right to vote. And you should exercise your right. I know you don't have to, but you should. Even if you just spoil your ballot because you don't like anybody, that's fine. But at least make it count. Because if enough people turn up and spoil their ballot, that might make them realize that um, we kind of have a bit of a problem here. Vote. Mm -hmm. Vote. Vote no matter what. Even, look, if you have to hold your nose for the candidate. JB, I saw yesterday, was talking about how in his writing, he said, the liberal candidate is viable. He's a member of the NDP. He's a card-carrying member and a proud NDP supporter and member. And he says, I'm voting liberal in the next election because the NDP candidate in my writing is not viable. So I will vote for the liberal government because we have to keep the cons out of power. And I think a lot of... NDP members and party stalwarts and supporters feel the same way because they know Jugmeet is unelectable with the, the behavior that he has exhibited over the last few years and the way he's gone about doing things. A lot of people are just saying, you know what? I'm going to hold my nose and vote for the Liberal candidate because the candidate in my riding is unelectable for my party. And we cannot, we cannot survive under a conservative government. And remember, they're conservative in name only. They're really the reform party. It's Preston Manning's reform party. Mm -hmm. Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm wrong. Prove to me that I'm wrong. If you can prove to me that I'm wrong, I will accept that. But I know nobody can because I'm not wrong. And I wouldn't say something if I had any doubt. I need to grab a cup of coffee, sir. I apologize, but I also have to um, see a man about a horse. So if you could take the reins for a few minutes while Absolutely. I do those two things, I appreciate that. Thanks. Sure. 
And it seems that uh, the first two offices for Czech strategies lobbied after its creation, the day after Pierre won the CPC leadership, uh, were the office of Melissa Lansman, member of Parliament House of Commons, and the office of Ryan Williams, member of Parliament for Bay Quinty House of Commons. Both of them were lobbied by Simon Jeffries with regard to having something to do with tele on the telecommunications file and the company Tech Savvy Incorpor Solutions Incorporated. So they registered and they got to work immediately lobbying the first business day after Pierre Polyev became leader of the party. I don't know, man. I don't know, man. But they want us to believe that they are against corporate lobbyists. I don't know, man. <laughs> it's a, uh, it's very, 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 very greasy. That's all I will say with regard to that. All right. Let's see. What else do we have in the news for you today? Um, at the Department of National Defense, um, Bill Blair announced that there will be changes brought to the National Defense Act. And one of the major changes that are being brought is, a, a, I guess, part. I'm not sure if this is the entire bill or just a part of the bill but the bill will require any sexual assaults committed within the Canadian Armed Forces to be investigated and prosecuted by the civilian justice system exclusively. So they're going to remove the military justice system's right to investigate and prosecute any uh, claims with regard to sexual assault. Uh, according to iPolitics, a new government bill would remove the authority of the Canadian Armed Forces to investigate and prosecute sexual assaults committed in Canada, transferring that responsibility to the civilian justice system. Tabled in the House of Commons yesterday, the bill implements several recommendations outlined by former Supreme Court Justice Louise Arbour through her sweeping review of sexual misconduct within the Canadian Armed Forces in 2021. If passed, sexual assault would be added to crimes like murder, manslaughter, and child abduction, all of which are tried outside the military justice system. Quote from Minister Bill Blair, We are reforming our institutions so that they meet the standards and needs of victims and survivors because it's the right thing to do for each and every member of the Canadian Armed Forces. Together, we are building a modern, inclusive, and supportive military culture. While Arbor had recommended that civilian authorities take charge of all sexual assault cases, senior military officials said incidents occurring outside of Canada will remain under military jurisdiction in the near term to ensure, to ensure compliance with international law. That being said, officials said Canada's provost marshal has written policies in place that encourage sexual assault charges to be laid in the civilian justice system, regardless of where the incident occurred, and internal work continues to determine how to responsibly for international sexual assaults, sorry, how responsibility for international sexual assaults could be transferred outside the military's purview. Officials added that work is already underway to recommend actions yet to be implemented, like the creation of a permanent military court and the civilianization of military judges. While the new bill does not include those measures, it does expand the, pure, the pool of people eligible to be appointed as military judges by no longer requiring them to be commissioned officers. Canadian Armed Forces struggles with establishing a safe and inclusive workplace are well documented. Figures released in December by Statistics Canada revealed 1,960 or 3.5% of regular members of the Canadian Armed Forces had reported being sexually assaulted in the last year, which represented a significant increase from 2018, and we reported that on the show at that time. The data also showed more than half of victims did not report the incident, about 64%, while approximately two-thirds, 66% of those who did not notify someone in authority said they faced negative consequences as a result of their decision, including exclusion, bullying, or retaliation. The bill also makes amendments to the National Defense Act to change how the Provost Marshal, who commands the Canadian Armed Forces Military Police, is appointed. Uh, 
Moving forward, the position which has been occupied by Brigadier General Simon Trudeau since 2018, I'm not sure if there's any relation to the Trudeau family here, I'm guessing not, would be appointed by the Governor General, making him accountable to the Defence Minister. Previously, the Provost Marshal would report to the Vice Chief of Defence Staff. Officials say the change is necessary to insulate the Provost Marshal, whose title would change to Provost Marshal General, from potential influences further up the chain of command. Lindsay Mat- Matheson, the NDP's critic for defense, described the bill as, quote, an important step, but said it fell short of a private member's bill she introduced last year. She tabled Bill C-363 in the House last November, which sought to make the Ombudsman for National Defense a completely independent entity that would report directly to Parliament. Quote, those survivors need that independence, fully independent of the government, fully independent of the chain of command. This legislation does a bit of that, but that doesn't necessarily address everything that my bill would have done. Her bill is currently awaiting second reading and currently sits outside the order of precedence, meaning it faces an uphill battle to becoming law. Now, she also sits on the House Defense Committee, and she said that she's eager for the bill to progress through the House so she can introduce amendments to strengthen it. Quote, I hope we can work together in our committee when we get that legislation. I know there are some changes that I'd like to see that really speak to the transparency piece that all survivors have called for. Conservative MP James Mazan, the party's shadow minister for defense, did not respond to iPolitics' request for comment. Gee, it's amazing how these conservatives that have so much to say whenever there's a video camera running somewhere yeah. have nothing to say when journalists come calling. That being said, Bill Blair said he was very hopeful his bill would be supported by all parties. Quote, I want this legislation passed. We've been working with other parties in the House, and I look forward to working collaboratively with our National Defense Committee. This is the right thing to do for men and women who serve in the Canadian Armed Forces. By the end of the calendar year, military officials said 32 of Justice Arbor's 48 recommendations will be implemented, with the remaining 16 being acted upon before the end of 2025. So there you go. It's big new, it, it is big news, and it's mm-hmm. something that needed to be done. Um, I hate to use the word sexy or unsexy talking about this subject in particular because we're talking about sexual assaults. Um, but these types mm-hmm. of uh, this type of work uh, of cleaning up systems, making sure that uh, they do well, uh, are not sexy public relations wise. They don't get you a lot of press. They don't get you a lot of kudos. They don't get you a lot of pats on the back. But they're absolutely essential and vital for the well-functioning oh, yes. uh, of our government, and uh, especially in this case, our military. So, um, you know, it, it's not flashy, and, uh, you know, you won't get a lot of screen time for it, but it's something that needs to be done, and I'm very happy to see that uh, all the recommendations of uh, Justice Arbor are going to be implemented and, uh, and that there's a plan for that. It's, we're not just getting the talk that they are, oh, yes, we will do it, that there's a plan and things are moving forward. Because it was overdue. And, you know, it's probably one of the reasons for which our military has a hard time recruiting because what woman would want to go into that type of environment? And uh, if you're a man uh, who's of the persuasion on feminist issues, anything close to me or Mr. Grizzly, Mm -hmm. why would you join an organization that allows that to happen? Who wants to be associated with that? Indeed, sir. So um, fixing this up will probably bring more people, men and women, back to the military. This absolutely needs to be done. Carol, you are correct. Change takes time. The military will get there. They will. They it will. has no choice. It has to. Mm-hmm. It just simply has to. Military, re- military readiness oblige. Mm-hmm. I need to address something here that I, I addressed in the chat. <clears throat> okay. but I'm going to be very vague about how I address it. Uh, we have said to people who hate us, feel free to hate watch us. Hate watch us as much as you want on any platform you wish. You're welcome to do so. And feel free to join the chat. We have two rules. Be respectful, and we do not tolerate intolerance. If you are disrespectful to anybody in the chat, if you are intolerant, if you show signs of sexism or racism or hatred, you get banned. I just banned somebody permanently for doing just that. I warned them. You get one warning on this show. One. This is not baseball. One warning. Behave or you're gone. So at Dayton Spink, you're gone forever. You do not get to come in here and disrespect the people in the chat. You can disrespect me. I don't give a shit. But the people in the chat, no. 
You're not doing that. You are permanently banned from this channel. Permanently. So you want to hate watch us? Feel free to do so. You want to join the chat? Feel free to do so. Be respectful and be tolerant. We do not tolerate intolerance and we demand respect for our members of the, the kits and cubs in the chat. Now, this might not make sense if you're listening to the audio-only version because there's no chat there, but I have to put my foot down sometimes, and this is one of those times. Don't make me go full blue jacket on you because I can be very yelly when I need to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm looking at some of his interventions here on the chat. Yeah, yeah. not, not, not happening. No, not happening. Look, and I warned him once. You get one warning. Yep. Behave or leave. And if you don't leave, I'm taking you out. Uh, Kit Toronto Dan says, how come the rest of Dayton uh, didn't uh, see, the rest of us didn't see Dayton in here. Uh, Dayton was uh, chatting through um, Twitter. through the Twitter platform and not through the, the YouTube, YouTube. Uh, yeah. platform. Carol, so. Carol DiLorenzi can see him. Uh, and you're welcome, Carol. Carol is also on the Twitter platform watching us. I don't know if you have access to YouTube or not. If you have access to YouTube, uh, Carol, by all means, join us. I'll put the, I'll put the, uh, it's already up there. The QR codes up there already. Oh, I know, but she might be watching on her phone. Oh yes. So you can't scan a QR code on exactly. your phone if you're on your phone, but yes. you can type in uh, www.youtube.com backslash at true North eager beaver media. That'll take you to our YouTube channel where you can of course like and subscribe, but you can also join in with the entire damn fam. Well, not the entire damn fam because the damn fam is spread across multiple platforms. But uh, you can join in with the YouTube Damn Fam chat, and I think you'd be really happy with them because they're all wonderful people who, and, and, and as we've said time and time again, we're trying to build a community here. And, and not every one of us see eye to eye and everything, and we don't even, we're not even trying to build that. We're trying to build a community of progressive people who want to make Canada a better place. Um, yes, Carol, actually, that would be the best way to watch. You can certainly watch on Twitter if you wish, but um, if you join us on the on our YouTube channel, and I'll, I'll put the uh, the link up there again, you'd have to type it in, of course, if you're watching on your phone, uh, but you can join in there, and we have a really robust chat on YouTube there, uh, so you can see everybody's commentary. Uh, Dayton Spink was on uh, Twitter only, so uh, the back and forth was literally between the two of you folks. Uh, but it, I can see what he's saying, and I'm not putting up with hatred, intolerance, sexism, racism. No, no, no. This is our little corner of the web. And in our little corner of the web, we respect each other. We even respect each other's likes and dislikes. We will be respectful, kind, courteous. We will be tolerant, but we will not tolerate intolerance. And that's my rant for that subject. Thank you, Carol. Thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate that. A um, little bit of news here because, um, well, because it made a lot of news. But on March 19th, so it's three days ago, um, the Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement has now passed both Houses of Parliament and is heading to the Governor General to receive royal assent. So Bill C-57 would implement the Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement. The purpose of the agreement is to propose promote the expansion of reciprocal trade and strengthen economic relations between Canada and Ukraine, among other things. Uh, I believe if the Conservatives were consistent with all their previous positions, that they voted against Bill C-57 mm. in its final vote on the th on third vote no I'm one's going, surprise yes i'm going to the our, our commons website here to uh, take a look at it but uh i don't see the vote thing right now i'll click on this and maybe they're reading there we go uh february 6th the vote was agreed of course as mentioned and uh, the website is not cooperating with me, so of I can't get not, the, the yays and nays there. Um, but I will keep looking for that so that I can get to you. But it is passed. So that's something that's very important that you should know. Linda, dropping some knowledge on us. Con conservative senators voted against the agreement. <laughs> Again, this is my <sighs> shock face. 
mein Schaufel. <lacht> <laughs> oh man so yeah um, now he's I just, I just can't wait for him to go to another another lobby mm -hmm. another lobby not another lobby another rally sorry pro Ukraine rally and talk about how he's uh, all for it Can I can I show you something here? I got to show you yeah. something here. You'll you'll like this. This is this is good. It's cute. I, I I added my own little commentary to it, but I thought I'd show you this because it's um. They tweeted this out uh, this morning. Why they tweeted this morning? Because it's literally they tweeted it at eight thirty a.m. March twenty second, twenty twenty four. So twenty five minutes ago, and I responded immediately. So let me just put this on the screen for the folks to see, and I'll read it out for the audio-only version. So uh, let me just uh, make it bigger here. The post from uh, at True North Center, True North Media, nothing to do with us. Conservative leader Pierre Polyev has put Justin Trudeau on notice. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, that's funny. That's yeah. funny. Planning a non-confidence motion this week if the Prime Minister doesn't scrap the impending carbon tax hike. Read more. Let's just scroll down to see what some of the comments are. Scrap carbon tax hike or face non-confidence motion, Pierre uh, Polyev tells Trudeau. Uh-huh. He didn't even bother to show up to vote in person. He tried and he failed again. Oh, I want to see what the comment is to me. Oh, it's probably offensive. He already knew how the vote would go. Are you dumb to, too dumb to realize the force? He forced the shit libs and the rest of the coalition to show Canadians exactly who they are. They voted against Canadian interest in for raising the carbon tax. What should we respond to this person? It's Yawn. not a coalition. <laughs> uh, it's not a coalition. He wasted our tax dollars. Did I spell that right? He wasted our tax dollars yet, yep. yet, yet, yet again. This was a poor, expensive PR stunt that failed. That, uh, failed. That failed <laughs> miserably. Uh, that should be a, an exclamation point, not a not a greater than single. What else should I add to that? It's, it's not a coalition. Oh, should I put it's a supply and confidence agreement? Learn your terms. Yeah, you can do that. You could also say that uh, it's like if he if the shit libs or the rest of the coalition showed exactly who they are, he basically said he showed exactly who he was too. So uh, the vote, the vote showed who they were as well. Whoops. Mm, the vote showed uh, who the cons are as we get more than we pay. 80% gets more than we put into it. Yeah. Anyway, we shouldn't be wasting time. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm just having fun with the kits here. Uh, so, yes, the the free trade bill with Ukraine did pass. Uh, and I did find it, the vote. It's 214 yeas to 116 nays, and only conservatives voted nay. Mm. So, I don't know, man. It's this carbon tax obsession that this guy has, that he's willing to sacrifice any other votes and even are standing on the international scene for it. Um, yeah oh yeah again not not impressive and he's certainly not doing canada any favors whatsoever he's not helping our reputation in any way with this uh sadly just, um yeah, the other daily and he doesn't give a damn yeah 
Now, the other thing that I noticed, uh, because a lot of people have been talking about it, and I've been wanting to mention it all week, but haven't been able to fit it in the show, and since it's a Friday show, we have time. Um, an MP that we all seem to like and seems to be rather unanimous, Mr. Sean Fraser, um, who is our now our housing minister and who's killing it as housing minister, put out a little video oh, yeah, yeah, earlier yeah. this week. I have uh, a, did we show it's a little over that? three minutes. I thought, no, we no, we, no, no we hadn't showed it yet. No, no, we hadn't yeah. had time to fit it in. Uh, so since we're talking about Pierre having a bad week, mm. uh, this one probably got his week started oh, yeah. off so, on the wrong foot. If you haven't seen this, you're about to see it. Yes, this and is about a week old now. It's really good because um, it hits all points and it's firing on all cylinders. Have yeah. a look at this. This is, this is going to be entertaining. Pierre Polyev pretends to care about helping you find a home. The truth is, he doesn't. Listen to the way he talks about starter homes for young people in this country. A tiny little shack. The woman who lives there defended her house. He called it a shack. A shack. That was a little embarrassing also, because it's not. And here's his perspective on affordable housing. They don't want nationalized, government-controlled homes, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. We don't need a Soviet-style takeover of housing. You know, it's interesting, because as Pierre reminds us constantly, he actually was the housing minister. When I was housing minister, 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 well, let's talk about when I was housing minister. The fact is, he wasn't very good at it, and I'm not even sure he cared. He only mentioned the word housing once in the House of Commons, and Canada built fewer homes that year than in any year since we formed government. And that's the total number of homes that were built across the entire economy. But when you actually look at what the government got done when Pierre was housing minister, his record's even worse. They supported exactly zero new apartments across Canada while he was minister. They withdrew from cooperative housing and supported none. And when it comes to affordable housing, Pierre was responsible for a grand total of six affordable units across the entire country. Now, these stats aren't a coincidence. They're a direct consequence of decisions that Pierre and his government made to make massive cuts to home building. And now he's promising to make those cuts again. In fact, Pierre has gone so far as to say that governments should get out of the business of home building altogether. And there's some weird stuff in this plan that just doesn't make sense. He wants to create a super bonus that only applies to a few select cities across Canada and has very little money in it, certainly not enough to make a difference. He's proposing to create an entire bureaucracy just to service a snitch line so people can rat out their neighbors if they disagree with their housing policies. We've put billions of dollars on the table to support the construction of hundreds of thousands of affordable housing units for low-income families across the country, and he promises to take that away. We've put new incentives in place to reduce taxes on home builders by removing the GST on the construction of new apartments. Pierre wants to put those taxes back on for hundreds of thousands of middle-class homes across this country. He plans to do away with the fund that has already landed dozens of agreements with cities in every region of the country. It's official, the city of Halifax and the federal government have struck a deal to fast track housing in the capital. Vaughan, London, Ontario, Edmonton, Toronto, Calgary, Vancouver, and the city of Winnipeg. What's more alarming than what is in his plan is what's missing. There's no mention of students, no mention of seniors, no mention of workers, no mention of the most vulnerable, and not a single measure designed to help you own a home. Pierre's plan isn't going to solve the housing crisis because Pierre doesn't care about the people that it impacts most. Pierre doesn't care about your community. Pierre doesn't care about building more homes. The thing that Pierre cares about most. When I'm Prime Minister, when I'm Prime Minister, well, when I'm Prime Minister, when I'm Prime Minister, is Pierre. Pierre Polyev, Polyev the Pierre doesn't care, Polyev. Uh, and this comment from Carol hits it. This is fantastic. Sean Fraser is a star. Daughter met him in Nunavut. Amazing guy. Very compelling. I couldn't agree with you more, Carol. Uh, he, he is a compelling individual. Uh, I haven't met him. I'd really like to meet him. I'd love to get him on this show. I like everything he's saying. And I, I don't know who he is as a person, but he's really effective as a member of parliament. And he's really effective as a housing minister because they've committed to... 750,000 homes, homes, residence, dwelling units, call it whatever you want, apartments, condos. They're getting it done because 
when it was downloaded, when, when the federal government got out of uh, public ha housing, which was what uh, started under Mulroney, correct, sir? Uh, yes, it was started under Mulroney. And then uh, with Cretchen, According he to the downloaded, Wellesley Institute. Right, and, and, and Cretchen downloaded to the provinces. Right. And the provinces have basically done nothing, even though they've been given money to do it. So when people are screaming for build houses, build houses, build houses, and then the federal government says, okay, we're going to just go straight to the municipalities. No, don't do it that way. Give the money to us, the provinces, the premiers. But, you, but we, we have been giving you money and you've not done anything with it. You've squandered it because we're not seeing anything getting built. So you know what? As a federal government, we're going to go straight to the cities and towns that need them, get the agreements in place, give them the money, get the housing built. Let's steal a slogan from Pierre Polyev's camp. Build the homes. Sean Fraser is actually doing just that. That is exactly right, Mr. Grizzly. Exactly right. Um, the next bit of news that I have for you, Kits and Cubs, I'm sure you will appreciate it because it has something to do with the subject that is very, very important to both of us and to a lot of you, which mm -hmm. is basic income. Yes. It seems that in Ontario, a judge has certified a class action suit against the province of Ontario because Doug Ford ended the basic income project early. Implemented a year prior by the Wynn government. Yes. After promising that he would not touch it, that he would allow it to run its way through. According to this article by CBC, Tracy Crossan says she ate healthier, slept better, and had more energy when she was receiving basic income payments from the Ontario government. Now she's left with $22 every month after paying rent and relies on Meals on Wheels. Crossan is just one of the tens, one of the thousands of people impacted after the province scrapped the basic income pilot project nearly six years ago. The early cancellation of the program in 2018 is behind a class action lawsuit that was certified by a superior court judge on March 4th. Quote, when I was on the OBI, I got to go and get a steak for $10 and have that for dinner once a month, said Crossan, who participated in the program in Thunder Bay, but now lives in Toronto for better access to medical care. Now I don't have the luxury for steak and hamburger and all that stuff. On Tuesday, the Toronto law firm Cavalusu LLP said the class action was brought forward by 4,000 people. It alleges Ontario breached the terms and conditions of the contract it entered with participants and seeks damages of up to $200 million. $200 million. Should have just paid the money, Doug. The pilot project was launched by Kathleen Wynne's Liberal government in 2017 in Lindsay, Hamilton, and Thunder Bay with the goal of learning how a basic income would affect people's well-being over a three-year period. It was axed in the summer of the following year, shortly after the Conservatives under Premier Doug Ford came into power. Tracy McKinnon, an anti-poverty advocate in Thunder Bay, has had similar experiences to Crossan. McKinnon says the OBI finally allowed her to stock up on food. It was nice to see my cupboards, my fridge, my freezer full of food, that never happened before. Since the pilot project ended, the cost of living has continued to climb across Ontario and more people are relying on food banks. Ontario has indicated it won't appeal the court's decision to certify the lawsuit, which means the case has entered the second stage, the Common Issues Trial. In an email to CBC News, a spokesperson for the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services said they could not comment on the case as it is before the courts. Tracy Mikshevsky, who goes by Willow, is one of the designated plaintiffs in the class action. She participated in the OBI in Lindsay and said it allowed her to start a skincare business, Raven Tree Naturals. Quote, my heart sank because I had a three-year plan to pay off my line of credit and have this business up and running enough that I wouldn't need to be an ODSP recipient anymore. For her, participation in the lawsuit has been a way to channel her anger in a positive way. In the years it's taken for the lawsuit to be certified, quote, certified, quote, we've had people die by suicide because they were going to be forced back into this hole they could not get out of. Joshua Hewitt was in and out of homelessness for about a decade. The Thunder Bay resident said the OBI helped him get into a better apartment and invest more time into his volunteer organization, Stand Up for Cleanup, which he launched while in recovery from alcoholism. Quote, a lot of the barriers just started to fade away because I was able to get out into the community and access resources, and I could go to restaurants that I normally wouldn't go to. After the pilot project ended, his three-year plan was tossed out the window. Now a single dad on Ontario Works, Hewitt says he's ha said that having a basic income would have made a huge difference for his family. 
quote, I felt like all the dignity I worked for and all the dignity they gave me with the program was just stripped away. It really is just a broken system. A single person on Ontario Disability Supports Program gets $1,308 a month for basic needs and shelter, or under $16,000 a year. A single person on Ontario Works receives $733 a month, amounting to less than $9,000 annually. CBC News asked the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services if that's enough to live on. In an email statement, a spokesperson said, quote, future increases for the ODSP are now tied to inflation and will occur each July, helping recipients to keep pace with the rising cost of life's essentials. No. No. It just makes sure that the amount of money that they have increases with inflation. If price of food should ever increase more than inflation, like has been the case since October 2021 up until this last inflation data, most recent one, then simply indexing to inflation wouldn't have helped them keep up at all. Mm. That in and itself is not true. We've made it possible for ODSP recipients to keep much more of the ODSP income support when working by increasing the earnings exception by 400%, allowing them to further support themselves and their families while continuing to contribute their community. Of course, one would have to know what that uh, real amounted to in real dollars the first time to see what 400% actually means in real dollars. Because let's like, say, you know, if they were only allowed to keep uh, $10 over off of every $100 they make, well... Now they're only allowed to keep 40, mm -hmm. still not half. So, you know, but when they opt for percentage over real dollars, usually it's because the real dollar amount is not that impressive. Exactly. Yes. The spokesperson has also said the federal and provincial children's benefits and the Ontario Trillium benefit help support affordability for Ontarians. The Ontario Living Wage Network calculates the living wage in Thunder Bay at $19.80 an hour. For a person working 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, that would equal to an annual income of just below $40,000, not including tax deductions. Right now, if you're an ODSP, you get $19,000. And Ontario works less than $9,000. Yeah, please tell me how you can survive upon that. You cannot. Yes. You can't. That won't cover your rent. Yep. Exactly. Bonnie... Nikolati is a researcher and program manager at the Lakehead Social Planning Council in Thunder Bay. The council helped bring about 1,000 participants into the OBI and advocates for a living wage. Quote, what it would mean is that people would be able to meet the social determinants of health. That includes social inclusion, being able to have a mental health supports, physical health, and all those things combined. It would really make a difference in people's life. Mm -hmm. While this is going on, at the federal level, there are efforts underway to establish a national framework for guaranteed livable basic income. Senator Kim Pate and Winnipeg Center MP Leah Gazan introduced Bills S-233 and C-223 in December 2021. If passed, the bills would require the finance minister to create such a framework within a year. Bill S-233 is further ahead, having reached second reading in the Senate last April. McKinnon and other anti-poverty advocates feel hopeful about the basic income bills, especially given the longer lineups at food banks and soup kitchens in recent years. It's not a handout. It's a hand up to help those that are struggling, she said. And um, I'm thinking up. that this could become a very, very important issue in the next federal election. Mm. If I were Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, I would be running, I would be making sure that uh, S-233 passed the House of Commons before the next election that says that we do have to have that framework that's now law, that we have to have, the, have that framework and that we are going ahead with it. And his opportunity to go ahead with it on the national level is probably going to also start with another pilot project. And it seems that there is one being planned on PEI. No. Mm. And it seems that, uh, well, the federal government might be able to get involved in this one. This uh, was 
uh, from November 22nd, 2023. A detailed report on guaranteed basic income released Wednesday morning, so this is back in November, says it would mean 65% fewer PEI children would be living in poverty along with 90% fewer people who live alone, and poverty could be virtually eliminated for people with disabilities. A proposal for a guaranteed basic income benefit in Prince Edward Island was written by a coalition of public servants, politicians, and advocates from PEI and across the country. It outlines how a five to seven year demonstration program might work in the province, including how much it would pay to individuals and how it might be paid for. The report establishes beyond doubt that a province-wide guaranteed basic income in PEI is feasible and realistic, says Jane Ledwell, a member of the PEI Working Group for Livable Income. Um, yeah, she said that through a news release. The report proposes a maximum annual benefit equivalent to 85% of the weighted average of PEI's three estimated regional poverty line thresholds for 2022. That would amount to about $19,252 for single adults and $27,227 for families of two adults. Benefits would be based on net income for census families. By using census families, the report authors account for ch adult children living with their parents. Those children might themselves have low incomes while living in a census household with high income. To avoid disincentives for working, the basic income would, would, be, re, re, sorry, would be reduced by 50 cents for every dollar of net income. Children are not included in family size counts because the Canada Child Benefit already provides income-tested funding for them. But island children currently living in poverty would see big benefits. The report argues with the poverty rate falling from 9% to 3.1%, the poverty rate for people living alone would drop from 27% to 3%. Overall, the poverty rate would fall from 10% to 2%. That makes it worth pursuing in my books. Mm -hmm. The report proposes that PEI offer the program in conjunction with the federal government. The full cost of the program would come to an estimated $189 million in the first year, and the authors propose the province pay 35% of that. The report outlines paying for the provincial share through higher taxes aimed in particular at higher income earners. The provincial sales tax would go up one percentage point with an offsetting increase in the HST rebate for lower income earners. This would increase provincial revenues by an estimate $28.5 million. The top marginal income tax rate would increase from 16.7% to 19.4%, raising another 21.4%. The report's authors believe the plan would mean a savings of, of $17.4 million as social service spending goes down. For middle income earners, the report estimates the tax cost of a few hundred dollars a year. For top earners, the increase quickly rises to close to $2,000. Those top earners would pay for close to half of the program. A guaranteed basic income would have benefits for the province that are difficult to quantify, the report says. In general, it says better living conditions would lead to better long-term outcomes in health, education, housing, community involvement in other areas. So it seems that the province of Prince Edward Island is looking at establishing one province-wide, and they want to put in 35% of the funds required to sustain it, asking the federal government for 65%. So mm. it seemed to me that offering that 65% to move forward with that pilot project on PEI would be a very, 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 very good election campaign move. Agreed. Let's keep your, uh, put a little pin in that one too, because uh, this particular government uh, is going to have to run, choose if they want to win the next election, they're going to have to choose some program policies um, that are eye-catching uh, and that will make want people to come out to polls. So basic income would probably bring some people to the polls that normally didn't come. Just like, for example, legalization of cannabis did in his first election, probably mm -hmm. brought some people to the polls oh, I, I'm, that I'm, wouldn't I'm normally... Good. Yeah, that normally wouldn't have. So things like um, anything climate, they would have if he has a another uh, uh, suite of measures or another uh, plank of measures that would act on another aspect of it. Uh, running on that, running on something UBI, um, maybe even a mandatory voting. I think type thing as well with an incentive. The, there's a couple of things that he could throw in the window that would definitely get to the attention of younger voters, uh, get attention of female voters, like, for mm -hmm. example, fall copying France and enshrining a uh, right to reproductive health in the Constitution. That's another one that would get to people to come. So a couple of three or four smart policies like that 
that he could just run week one. I'm going to hammer this one week two. I'm going to hammer this one week three. I'm going to hammer this one week four. I'm going to hammer this one. We get through our 36 days and boom. Um, that might be his path. And these types of things might be uh, giving us some hints as to some of the things that might be there. Of course, the budget that's going to come down on April 16th might give us a couple of other hits because if there's anything that needs to be positioned for about a year mm -hmm. and a half from now, uh, that's probably going to happen during that budget. I would think so. Yes. Some of the comments in the chat here are really addressing this. And, and this one here, I think, from Linda is, is um, pertinent and, and valued and direct and hammers at home. Look what happened after COVID in Serb. People realized they didn't have to put up with jobs that paid them less than they're worth. There were people who had been in the service industry for a very long time. And when the service industry was shut down and they had to take Serb, which was a hell of a lot less than what they were earning because I'm talking bars and restaurant folks who were earning decent living, you know, most, mostly on tips because the wage is pathetically low. Well, those folks were able to uh, retrain themselves and get jobs in a different field where they didn't have to put up with harassment during the day in their workplace. Well, let me rephrase that, actually. Let me reframe that. A different type of harassment, because let's face it, we have not been able to eradicate harassment or harassment, however you like to pronounce it, in the workplace entirely. We're working towards it. But in the service industry, it's often just accepted you will get harassed, which is wrong and needs to change. And we are educating people. And I know that Gen Z is coming forth and saying, we're not going to put up with this shit. Pay me what I'm worth. You do not get to get rich off of my back. Share the wealth or we leave. Yep. It's real simple. They're calling it quiet quitting. What is quiet quitting? For those of you who have A, been unfamiliar with the term and B, don't know what it means. It means if you're paid from nine to five with a 30 minute lunch and two 15 minute breaks, you take your breaks, you take your lunch, you punch in at nine and you punch out at five. And a lot of corporate jobs, so what are you leaving for? The project's not finished. Oh, I'm only paid till 5 o'clock. I'll see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. But we didn't get everything done. That's really not my problem. If you increase the workload, I can't get it done in the allotted work time. The allotted work time is 9 to 5. I work 7 hours. I have a 30-minute lunch break, which is not a long enough. It's not long enough. Unless you bring your lunch... If you brown bag it, most people don't. I, I, not a lot of people I find brown bagging their lunch because when you're leaving to go to work at 8 o'clock in the morning, brown bagging your lunch, trying to make, you know, some people do meal planning on a Sunday and have their stuff ready to go. Not everybody has the time for that. So if you mm -hmm. quiet quit, as they say, which basically means you are working to your required job requirements, <laughs> that's it. Eight to four, nine to five, seven to three, take your lunch break, take your coffee breaks or your breaks, work your seven hours in your eight hour shift and leave at the end of it. They call that quiet quitting. I call that working to the expectations of what you're required to do. But somebody wanted to call it quiet quitting to make it seem like you weren't doing what you're supposed to do. You're just doing your damn job. And people mm -hmm. are fed up with being expected to do more for a less and in many cases free and a large corporation that I know of tells their managers to grab that person that just clocked out. I just need you for 15 minutes to help unload this truck. Uh, sorry. I know. I know you're I'll make it up to you later. They never make it up to them later. And what they're doing is robbing you of your wages. I know of major corporations that do this. I've seen it done. I've had them try to do it to me, and I'm like, oh, let me just clock back in. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm sorry, I don't work for free. This is not a charity. This is a for-profit enterprise. Pay me. And I get mad at some organizations that ask for volunteers. We need volunteers to help organize this concert event. You're a for-profit organization, right? Yes. Pay me. Pay me. Volunteering for a charity is one thing. Volunteering for a for-profit organization is stupid. 
It's stupid. Look, we live in a capitalistic world, so make capitalism work for you. Get what you're worth. Get paid for your efforts. Get paid for the work you put in. Do not work for free. One thing to volunteer for something like the Terry Fox run or a breast cancer run or a charity fundraising or a Cornerstone Housing for Women, which is my chosen charity, I will do things to help them out. Happily do it of my own free will and my own free time. That's different than your employer asking you to work for free. That's different than a for-profit organization looking for volunteers to help keep the place clean. No, pay me. Pay me for my job. Well, we'll give you free tickets to the show. That's nice. Pay me for my time. My time isn't free. Well, the pass is worth this much money. Uh Uh-huh. And if you were paying me X number of dollars per hour and I work this many hours, I would earn a lot more than what you're giving me. Pay me kind of mob boss like f you pay me f you pay me where's my money where's my money pay me get paid what you're deserved don't let people put you under their thumb now look i admit it i am underpaid in my position i know this but because i am contracted out to a crown corp and i love the crown corp where i work because they treat me with respect, they treat me like an equal, they appreciate the work that I do, and they tell me that daily. They tell me I'm an important part of the team. I don't know if that's true or not, but hearing all those things makes me want to continue to work there. My employer, I tell them all the time, you don't pay me enough. You need to pay me more. I tell them that. I went from a salaried position to an hourly position. So guess what? I work overtime sometimes, but I'm getting paid for it. I work overtime when the job demands it because I want things to go smoothly at the place that I work at and I'm getting paid for it. Get paid for what you do. And quiet quitting? No, no, that's not, that's no, I hate that term. It's called working to the expectations of the job, working your required hours. When you leave at the end of your shift, that is not quiet quitting. Working extra means they're getting free labor from you. Mm -hmm. Corporations rely upon this. Mm -hmm. They rely, well, we pay you this much money. I remember somebody who was close to me once said, well, I'm a senior executive manager and they pay me $300,000 plus. So when you earn that kind of money, you're expected to do more. And I go, you are paid for 40 hours a week. If you work longer, They're getting free labor from you. Yeah, but they pay me this much money. They pay you for 40 hours a week. No more. I don't care how much they're paying you. If you work longer, you need to get paid more. Unless they're giving you shares or giving you time off in lieu of, which they're not. Paid time off, by the way, in lieu of. That you can actually access. That you can actually access. Unless they're doing that then they're taking advantage of you and, and, and making money off your free labor. That's 100% profit for them. Yep. Boss better have my money. <laughs> what, what Jim says right here, working according to the agreement that was made. Yep. You signed your contract, work to what your contract is. Do not do extra unless they're willing to pay you extra. In my case, they decided to move me to hourly. So... I'll do extra, but I get paid for it. Mm -hmm. So do I have a problem with working a little bit extra when required? No, I'm getting paid for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't have an issue with that. I'm getting paid for it, but that was their move, not mine. They went from hour uh, salary to hourly because they figured, well, you know, sometimes uh, the employees who do this sort of stuff, their hours, my hours are always the same and sometimes they increase. So this works out to my benefit, not theirs. Mm. Now, that being said, they did say, well, if you work extra, you earn extra money. And I'm like, what makes you think at 55 years of age that I want to work more? I want to work four days a week. That's it. <laughs> that's it. That's all I want to work. Yep. 32-hour work week, that's what I want. I know I have to work 40 plus so I can keep my head above water. I don't have a choice. Yep. PNC bio going here. I quickly learned how useless five weeks of paid vacation that you can't use is. 
Exactly. <laughs> Can I book some vacation right now? Oh, no, no. We're so busy, this project. Uh-huh. I've been on the receiving end of that before. Never again. And yeah. where I'm... So I'm employed, I'm employed by one company who contracts me out to the Crown Corp. The Crown Corp said to me last year, Paul, you need to take some vacation time. And I go, but there's nobody to cover for me. They go, not your problem. Book your vacation time. I'm like, yeah, but if they can't find somebody to fill it, they won't give it to me. They go, don't worry. We'll have a conversation with them about that. I was like, okay, you've got my back. They're like, yes, we do. You need a vacation. You're going to burn out. Everybody needs time off. Paid time off. Otherwise, you will burn out mentally and physically. The mental burnout is really bad. The physical burnout you can recover with usually with a couple of days off. Mental burnout, that takes a few weeks yep. to completely unplug. You know, they say, well, just take a week and head down to so-and-so in a warm place in the, in the wintertime for one week? That's not enough. My goodness, I, the, the, just the, the travel expectations, you're stressed out about getting to where you're going. When you arrive, you unpack and you try and relax, but you're still thinking about work, your little jet lag, maybe not jet lag because it might have been just straight south in the time zone, but you're exhausted from the travel. But now you're thinking about work because you it takes three to four days to unplug from work. So if you go for a week, the whole time you're thinking about the travel and the work and then next thing you know, shit, we got to catch a flight tomorrow morning. Let's get packed. Let's, make, let's double check. Let's make... yep. Unless your name is Jack Reacher and you travel with the clothes on your back and a toothbrush, you're going to have some stress when it comes to taking time off. Indeed. Indeed. Now, speaking of good employees, mm -hmm. we have a Canadian that we need to be a little proud of. Oh, and who, who might that be, sir? Friend of the Beaver Lodge and Canada National Observer. Oh, is, Max? Yes, yes. Canada National Observer is proud to announce that our lead columnist, Max Fawcett, has been nominated for a National Newspaper Award for Column Stay. Writing. The prestigious Mary Ann Shad Carey Award for Columns is awarded each year to the top Canadian commentator. This nomination is recognition that Max is among the very best political writers in the country. Quote, I'm thrilled Max has received this well-deserved honor for his brilliant and influential writing, Canada's National Observer founder and publisher Linda Wood said. Max's nomination is based on three pieces examining conservative attacks on the federal government's climate policy, the federal liberals' carbon, sorry, the federal liberals' carbon tax communication problems, and the war on expertise. His no-holds-barred insightful observations on federal politics and climate policy make him a popular guest on podcasts and television broadcasts. In addition to writing a regular column for Canada's National Observer, Max writes a weekly newsletter offering readers additional commentary. Max keeps up this blistering pace only as only someone who lives and breathes politics could do. Quote, I've always loved politics and I've always loved writing about it, so this is already a dream job for me. Getting recognized as a finalist in this always competitive category is just icing on the cake. Here's hoping I can do the Observer team proud when they announce the winner next month, said Max. As Max's editor, this is Adrian Tanner, the editor-in-chief of the National Canada Observers, she says, as Max's editor, I can say he's a delight to work with. His copy consistently sings. His ideas often challenge my assumptions. And at least once a week, I'm treated to a laugh out loud moment. Doesn't get better than that. Congratulations, sir. Well done. Well done. We got to get Max back on the show again. We haven't had him yeah. in a while. Too bad it's not like a, a vote in because I would definitely be filling in ballots. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah no, no doubt. But yes, much deserved. Well earned. Way to go, Max. We're, well we, done, we, sir. Are, we, we, we are rooting for you. We I salute think. you, sir. Yes, we do. We do very much. And finally, um, because it might be time for us to uh, make an exit soon. Yes. What do you think, Mr. Grizzly? Yeah, I think, I think we should uh, start to wrap it up a little bit here. I got, I got a meeting in a few minutes I got to attend, and I've got a few things on my plate I got to deal with. And uh, all right, yeah, I've got some stuff. Then we'll talk a little sports ball. Um, sports ball. Sports ball, yes, because the Canadian mixed doubles curling championships are on and they're down into the playoffs. Uh, I was trying to see whether or not we can view them. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be broadcast anywhere, which is really weird because if you can't see it, you can't be it. Mm -hmm. uh, the only place you can find it is on Curling Canada's actual website if you uh, bought uh, something for $10 to be able to watch uh, the whole competition there. 
uh, but I uh, can't seem to find any uh, anything posted on YouTube and or any matches uh, broadcast. I do not know if the pro- the final will be broadcast, but it is competing with the World Women's Championships. So it's kind of weird that they're being held at the same time as well. It doesn't really help the sport mm-hmm. in that sense because I was hoping to look at some because you know, well, doubles is the the category in which I'm in a division, and I was hoping to see some matches and pick up some tips and some strategy. But it is not uh, on YouTube not nor be, yes. on uh, broadcast television. At uh, the World Championships, uh, the Canadians so far have a perfect record still. So I think they've now won 27 matches in a row and have only lost five matches all year. Wow. Team That's pretty Oklahoma. spectacular. And one of the teams to whom uh, they lost a match was Team Italy uh, after an. Uh, season uh, play and uh, when they play them in the round robin uh they did uh, defeat italy so they are the only uh, team right now they've got two matches left to play and uh but uh, of their first 10 in the round robin section they are now 10 and zero uh their toughest match was against turkey uh, turkey actually really? uh yeah they were having a real tough match until uh, the eighth end uh, when our team uh, home and uh, broke uh, the score open by scoring a five. I didn't and, know uh, Turkey had a, had a curling team. Yeah, 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 they do. Uh, good, they put at the World you, last year as well. Good on yeah. you, Turkey. Good. Yeah. Seriously. Well done. Last year, last year, the women's team did well. They finished six and six in the round robin portion. Uh, this year, they're not doing as well, unfortunately. So like a country that does not really have a tradition of curling. Yep. Well done. Yep. Well done. Yep. They're one of the strongest uh, countries in Europe in curling now. Fantastic. Yep. Fantastic. I know that Turkey has mountains that you can ski in. Did you know that Iran has some of the best ski resorts in that part of the world? Like, actually, and they would compare to anything in the Alps? I did not know that. And out west? Oh, yeah. Some of the resorts in Iran, I, I, would, I would love to ski. And it was my friend uh, who pointed it out. She's, she was born in Iran. She came here, I think, when she was 12, 13 years old. And she still has a lot of family over there. And she, she showed me some photos and sent me to some I'm like, oh, my goodness. The ski resorts in Iran are amazing. Hmm. And and really affordable by our standards. It's just the getting there is the hard part, and then you know there's some other issues involved. But uh, Iranian people are beautiful people, and at one point their democracy, um, when it came to, and we had this conversation. Who was our guest who was talking about that some time ago? How they were much more advanced in egalitarian and feminist uh, ways. Was it act- Mubin? Yeah, Mubin, Ooh. I believe it was. Yeah, it might have been Mubin. Back in the 50s and 60s, uh, they were they were so much more advanced than we are here. Yeah. So much more advanced. And then the religious right took over. And, and you know, people are fighting back, thank goodness. Uh, you do need to remember a, a commentary about Iran. I'm going to just drop in here real quick. Is that during the Islamic revolution of the late 70s, when they took the hostages, uh, the American hostages, and Canadians rescued a bunch of them, when when that happened, you need to understand that one of the things the uh, Ayatollah Khomeini said was, send your children to the infidels' land so they can learn their ways. So a lot of Iranian citizens were educated in the United States and in Canada. They went to, uni- uh, they went to private schools and universities here. And, and the state funded a lot of that education, you know, to pay for them to attend university and, and private school and universities here. And when they came home, instead of hating on the West, they came back with a whole new set of uh, perspectives. And I say perspectives because it was millions of citizens who lived here for a number of years. And when they came back home, they kind of went, you know, that whole freedom West thing, that whole equality feminist thing that my mother told me we used to have, I think we'd like to have that back. The average age, I think, in, in Iran is about 54, 55. So it's Gen X. Hmm. Gen X that was educated here. Gen X that likes freedom, likes music, likes rock and roll, likes to have a drink. There is a cultural revolution taking place in Iran. And people from that part of the world know it. People who live in that part of the world have been showing us this for the last few years now. It's not changing. It is changing for the better, and 2024 is the year of the pushback. And I mean that globally, because we're sick of authoritarian dictatorships and fascism. Citizens are going, you know, there's a better way. 
democracy is a better way. Freedom of movement, freedom of choice is a better way. None of those things were ever taken from us in this country, despite what some people would like to have you think. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> also, that was heavy. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Yes. Also, in uh, Canadians that make us proud. Yes. Sir. Uh, another week, another world champion. Oh, who is this? Yes. The International Skating Union is hosting the World Figure Skating Championships in Montreal mm -hmm. right now. And the competition started on uh, Wednesday, I believe, with the short program for the men and for the couples. And then last night we had the final for pairs. And um, Canada's pair of... Um, Sorry, Diana Stilato Dudek and Maxim Deschamps. Uh, I had a chance to watch their short program yesterday, the short program competition. Uh, they did really well. They finished first after the short program. They were almost four full points ahead of the second place team from Japan, who were the reigning world champions. And it seems that uh, even though I haven't had a chance to watch their free skate yet, that uh, they did it yesterday and they maintained their first place so Diana Stellato Dudek and Maxim Deschamps are world champions in pairs figure skating mm. and they secured that Thursday night the two time the two time national champions posted a personal best score of 221.56 after skating to interview with a vampire in the free program they placed first in the short program on Wednesday to give themselves a 3.95 point cushion and followed it up with a personal best of 144.8 in the free program to dethrone defending champions Riku Miura and Ryuchi Kihara of Japan. They had the best score in the free program but finished with silver at 217.88 and Germany's Minerva Fabienne Haas and Nikita Volodin took the bronze with 210.40. Now the reason this matters a lot is not only because Canada has world champion but um We've talked about them before a lot because Diana Stellato Dudek decided to go back to competitive skating in her late 30s. She is now 40. Wow. And she becomes the oldest woman figure skater to win a world title. Fantastic. So, and you can tell on the ice, by the way she skates, there's her carriage the line in her back mm -hmm. when she's doing all roots, she has the. You often hear people judge say, "Oh, there's a maturity to this performance." Well, that you can literally see it when she is performing. Um, she lights up a rig. By the way, she's got a million watt smile, um, and Maxime Deschamps, uh, who's you know several years her, her junior, seems to have an absolutely incredible partnership with her and um they communicate very well and they seem to get along very well so it's also her first medal medal at the senior world championships she was a single silver medals at the 2000 world junior championships and she had retired at the age of 17 due to a chronic hip injury but she revived her career 16 years later as a pair skater rather than a, than a single skater. And in 2019, she moved to Montreal and joined forces with Deschamps. Hmm. Pretty cool. Now, she is American-born, but it seems that she will receive her Canadian citizenship in time to represent Canada at time for the 2026 Winter Olympics. Um, we also had two other Canadian teams in the competition, Leah Pereira of Milton, Ontario, and Trent Michaud of Brantford, Ontario, who finished eighth with 186.93, and Kelly Anne Lorrain of Saint Jérôme, Quebec, and Lucas Etier of Saint Alphonse, Quebec, were 15th in the World Championship debut. There were 24 teams entered in total in the competition, and the top 20 got to go on after the short program. Got to go on and skate the final. So, um, yeah, nice. File under Canadians who do as proud and file as. I always say Canadian girls because mm -hmm. G R R L L Z. Kind of interesting to say Canadian girls kick ass for a woman who's 40. Mm -hmm. But Canadian girls kick ass. <laughs> <laughs> Even at 40, kicking you can ass, still be out kicking ass. ass. World champion. 
How do you like that? For those asking, um, this is the current uh, Lola state. <laughs> oh. She's uh, sound asleep on, on, in, in her little bed beside me. <laughs> she can, uh, right, she's a little stretched out in that photo, but she oftentimes donuts completely uh, where she, she's entirely in that thing. She does it frequently. It's quite funny. <laughs> Lovely, 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 lovely. Yeah, that's why. That's why she's not hopping up on me. I think we we got it. well. She, the whole bed's a pillow. She just likes to stick her head out. I don't know why she does that. But sometimes when she gets, oh no, she has a giant bed, Linda, a giant bed, like huge. But she likes this one, and she will curl right up in a complete little donut when she feels like it. She has a very large bed. Trust me, it's made of three inches of memory foam. It's about seven feet long. So when she wants to stretch out entirely, she can. She just likes to sleep in this little one from time to time. Ah, oh, good, good. And that uh, just to finish it off, at the the Canadian Mixed uh, Doubles Curling Championships, there are four teams left, and they're in the playoffs. And uh, probably the most recognizable team out of all of them, Jocelyn Peterman and Brent Callant, because they were the 2019 National Championships champions and 2023 finalists. It was actually because of Jocelyn Peterman and Brent Callant that we actually earned right to compete in the olympics in mixed doubles the mm. first year it was there that when we ended up winning the gold but up until the point of uh, olympic qualification because canada focused most uh, on the four uh, team for four member team we didn't actually we hadn't actually had a uh, spot qualified so they had to i think they had to go into the world championships that year i think finish top three absolutely that year to call a qualify a spot for canada and they had but they didn't actually get to represent Canada because they didn't win right. the Canadian championships, but they did qualify us for a spot that allowed us to win the gold medal in the first year. Uh, While well, they're still in uh, the competition uh, right now, and for my, my money, I'd say that they are probably favored to win. Uh, so uh, Jocelyn Peterman and Brett Collant, people will know them, uh, know those names who follow curling because they have played on uh, four-person teams and have uh, done very, very well. I think they might have actually both won national championships as part of their four member teams as well. So there you go. We have some Canadians that make us proud to celebrate. Mr. Grizzly, do we have a show? I believe we do, sir. All right, kiss and cups. That's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. And uh, I noticed that when we opened the show, there was a, a kit that said that they... Um, um, liked the fact that I, I sing a little bit in the morning when I say on mm. the cry media network. I'm trying to convince, you know, when you used to listen to the radio back in the day and they always had the, the, this little, little musical sort of station identification. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. It's yeah like yeah. you are listening to the cry media network. Yeah. Yeah. We need we need both. we could actually record something like that and I could multi-track your voice and put a oh, chorus really? on it. Yeah, if you oh, want. that would be cool. I'm home Just all day. Like, if you want to do that, we can do that. I don't I don't know if Dean would randomly play it every now and then though. No, but we'll 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 record it and we'll send it to him and say here if you want to do this. <laughs> uh, I'm a one man barber shop. There you go. <laughs> uh, we hope that you love listening to us because we love making you. this for you because sharing is caring. Please let everybody know about us. Share the word because sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless. And if you Karen would like to sharing, support, not Karen, sharing is caring, not Karen. Yeah. And, and Sharon isn't Karen. No, Sharon is Sharon and Karen is Karen. <laughs> sharing is caring. <laughs> uh, uh, good Tabby G says, get locked to a company with the harmonica. <laughs> Actually, that'd be, that'd be amenable then. Ah, if you'd like to support us in other ways, you can do that. Thanks to the fabulous feisty and fiery, the Ray girl who has sponsored our pod page. So if you scan that QR code, that's just be it just beneath my chin. Well, then that will bring you to our pod page site. And if you're listening, that's podpage.com slash the true North eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. And when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, we come directly to you. If you'd like to support us in other ways, you need to make like Kit Elaine, 
right on time, my dear. Thank you so much. Who tells you to have a beyond awesome day? And remember to smash that button before you leave. And if you want to smash that button, then you need to go to the True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube page. Ooh, somebody scanned a QR code. Thank, Thank you. you so very much. So if you go there, we have three buttons for you. Like, share, subscribe. Click one, click two, click three. Click them, tweak them, lick them. Flick them. Like the hey. old tequila t-shirt, lick it, slam it, suck it. There we go. We don't judge. We do not judge. What you do with our buttons on your own free time is your business. Mm. So long as you click them, we get happy. It's, yeah, we do. It doesn't matter what time of the day you do it. Ooh, somebody else got to the QR code. It doesn't matter what time of the day you do it, too. You could do it at 3 o'clock in the morning. If I'm having a dream, all of a sudden, I smile. Yeah, well, here's, <laughs> here's the thing. we've been receiving email uh, from a couple of kids and cubs lately that were saying, you know, I never miss your show at the in the evening. So they can't, you know, because their work schedule, they're not able to join live, but uh, they, they join later in the evening. So thank you. Thank you yes. for the folks. We know not everybody can watch live. We get that. We start at seven in the morning and some days like today, what time is it? It's almost 10 o'clock. My goodness. Um, we start usually a little after seven because, you know, sometimes... Uh, Somebody's a little bit light. <laughs> mm. I don't know her. <laughs> I don't, I don't know her. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, we, we start early in the morning and not everybody can do that. Uh, depending upon your work schedule, your shift, you might have kids to get out the door. You might have to be at work. Maybe you start at 7 a.m. and you might be able to join from the office. Maybe you don't work in an office. You might be construction. You might be a truck driver. You might be... Uh, a, a, a hospital worker you might be a service i don't know what you do and that doesn't really matter to me we thank you for watching when you can and this is the beauty of this format you can watch it whenever you want you want to join in live we're live every day well monday to friday at 7 a.m yep. you can't do it that's cool watch us later yep. and we oftentimes will flip and have the repeat of the show maybe a day or two later and i try and air them around noon so that if you got a little bit of lunchtime time you can jump in and watch Yep, absolutely. So we thank you very much. Our YouTube page, you go there, click our buttons, and that makes us happy. And if you would like to support us in yet other ways, this, oh, right now the QR code was showing the YouTube page. Now switched we're back, back to this one. There we go, switched it back. Um, you can help us, well, cover the costs for oh, the show Cassie. by, oh. No, I'll, oh, I'll read that out please. for the audio because this this is a huge hugely flattering comment to us lads the quality of your show is worth waking up an hour earlier on manitoba time and so is the damn fam chat community mm. thanks cassie we know how much you, you know how much we love you and and you have joined in on some uh joined in on the on the podcast and i think you were last uh friday for, international women's day our, yes. our evening special yes yes Yes. And I, I don't know if James was in the chat earlier or not, if he's going to be doing Casual Friday. I don't know. I'll, I'll chat with him at some point today and find yes. out. Yes. Yeah, that would be nice if we could. Um, because I won't be able to do many, uh, do the next three after that because we'll have... Uh, You'll be busy. We'll be, uh, we'll be on stage. Yes. Yes. All right. Um, I think... Did we do that? Hmm? No, coffee. Know. No, I didn't give the coffee address yet. <laughs> I was in the middle of it. The QR code is there. Yes, the QR code is there if you want to scan it. And if you are listening, our coffee page can be found at coffeeko-fi.com slash eagerbeaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. And there you will find the Beaver Lodge Emergency Hydration Fund, where our pals, good lads and gals, Guinness Hot Chocolate Cafe and Caesar, are there to help us write, edit, perform, produce, market, deliver the show to you. Please, Help keep us moist. I have an Maybe LP even turn meeting. us to the sun every now and then. I have an LP meeting around uh, 4.30 this afternoon that I have to attend. Uh, it's mandatory attendance uh, Fridays for the LP meetings. And uh, yeah, it'll be good. Longer you know, patrol? Lieutenant's pump. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and sometimes LP meeting. LPP meeting. Lieutenant's pump patio. Ooh. 
You, you've you've attended a couple of times actually. I have. LPP meetings. I have. You, you've have very very up. very very productive meetings. We get a lot. And you've met some of some of my uh, Scotch and Cigar Club crew uh, amongst a couple others. And and here's the best part. So, <laughs> Mr. Beaver has met with some of these gentlemen, and they are yes. older. Yes. White. Yes. Progressive conservative. Yes. Progressive being the important factor, and they've welcomed you in, like completely. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, it took call of like thirty seconds. Yeah, literally. Yeah, they're like, come sit, have, and and I've said this is my podcast partner, my buddy, my brother from another mother, Douglas, and they're like, oh hey, yeah, we've seen your show, we know who you are, yeah. no issues whatsoever. Nope, nope, smooth. And again, sailing. old white men, progressive conservative, progressive being the key word here, key word. They still say I'm a conservative. I'm like, please put progressive in front of that because I know you don't identify with the current crop, and they're like, yes, you're right, Paul. Every single time, every single time. Because yep. when I say Joe Clark, progressive conservative, and uh, Justin Trudeau, liberal, we're literally like <laughs> maybe that far apart. Even if yeah. it, it, even that, I mean, yeah. we're you know, you can slide yeah. a piece of paper in between how far apart we are. Yep, pretty much, pretty much. So, all your support, kids and cubs, very, very important. Thank you for everything that you do. We are very, very grateful. And because democracy is something that you do pen to paper, write those letters. Um, it seems that um, when we talked about yesterday, um, Kit Angela, by the way, how she got to the attention of uh, Mayor Horvath enough to actually get a meeting. I saw something on the web that uh, seemed to indicate that uh, the meeting might have been just for show because oh, no. uh, it seems that um, the campers, I think, are in their 23rd day uh. of camping, which was supposed to be only like three or four days originally. Mm -hmm. Uh, to the vote on the Wednesday, but I think they're at the, either 23 or 32. I can't remember, but I, I think it's 23. Um, she finally had a meeting with Andrea Horvath, and it seems that um, they needed outhouses so they can relieve themselves. And it seems that uh, the city did not help that, help with that. It seems that there's a, a church that has decided to front the costs for that. Um, trying to figure out which church so that I can tell you kids in case some of you would like uh, to make a donation to it in order to help it cover that, mm -hmm. uh, to let them know that uh, the community sees them and appreciates them and wants to participate uh, in this. But uh, yes, the people that are there seem to be particularly dedicated to the cause because they had only planned to be there about three, four days originally. It's over 20 days. They finally did get the attention of the mayor, but it seems that uh, the mayor has remained unconvinced. Yeah, yeah. Well, does that come as a surprise to you? It doesn't, it doesn't. Mm. Mm -hmm. Like, if I take everything I know about mayor... Andrea Horvath and disassociated from everything I thought I knew of her right. as leader of the Ontario NDP party. Andrea no Horvath. surprise. No surprise. I am not surprised. Yeah. If I factor in the fact that she was what for three or four terms, oh, yeah. the leader of the Ontario NDP party. And at one time NDP potentially consists or NDP and potentially considered as, um, premier material because mm -hmm. there was a point at one time in the polls where she was leading and she looked like that she she had a chance of winning mm -hmm. a provincial election um then then i am surprised because i don't know where i don't know where any trace of her ndp roots went since she, she became threw mayor. them out she threw them out clearly clearly i wonder if she actually ever had them well, that's the thing that's making making me wonder too. I'm wondering if she ever had them, uh, because she certainly didn't compete in those elections to win, and she seemed quite happy to want to take down the liberals. And you know, yeah. I mean, in the last elect previously election, she took down the liberals, and as soon as she lost, then went to run for mayor. And now, technically, because cities are the creations of the province, she's working for Doug Ford, and she doesn't seem to be standing up to him very much. Of course not. She's at the trough. So for someone who made the change so quickly to working for Doug Ford rather than trying to replace them, it kind of makes me wonder how much she was invested emotionally in actually trying to replace them. Maybe we can get her on the show and ask her. Do you think she'd be willing to come on? Probably not. She'd probably be willing to come on. I don't think she'd be very willing to come on if she knew that question was waiting, though. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I think it's a question that should be asked. And, and again, we're not, a, you, we're not a gotcha show. We don't do that. But if we were going to have her on the show, I'd let her know in advance. We're going to ask you about this. So you can opt out right now if you don't want to answer it because we're going to ask you about it because we need to know. Ontarians want to know. Where did you go? What happened? Where did you go? My lovely. Boom, 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 boom. Where did you go? We want to know. My Andrea. <laughs> doom, doom, boom, boom. Yeah, she, uh, yeah, then she wouldn't come on. Yeah. No. Somebody, some, somebody deserves a Vanishing Cream Award. We, we, we still see her physical president, presence. We just don't know where the rest of her went. And as we've said, uh, when we have guests on, it's less of a grilling interview and more of a conversation. Occasionally we ask tough questions. As when, when we had um, Mark Gerritsen on, you asked him a couple of tough questions and he didn't back down, he didn't push back, he didn't fight. Mm-hmm. And he also was aware of the fact that you are his constituent. Mm-hmm. So, you know, as a constituent, asking a question of your member of parliament, he didn't run away. He didn't hide. He didn't back down. Sometimes he didn't really have an answer, but... Uh, not everybody can answer every question, though. Yeah, legitimately. exactly. Right? Yeah. Well, I would and, be I was asking to... a lot of... Uh, I mean, I did take him on an interesting train. I was asking a lot of questions about what you're going to do to like to make sure, make sure that people can cast a fully informed vote, mm-hmm. which is probably not the first question an MP of a writing gets. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's like, no, what about it. my taxes? What about my health care? What, uh, what about my right to cast an informed vote? Uh, didn't plan for that one. Sorry. <laughs> and I don't think many members of parliament would have a plan to answer a question like that. Yeah. I mean, realistically. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean. So, no anger know, there, you know. But, but, you know, uh, not being able to have an, an answer right at hand didn't stop him from being able to speak, mm-hmm. uh, you know, as to what, uh, give, share his thoughts on what the utility of such measures could be and how we could go about them and how we could explore them. And, exactly. you know, so hopefully there was uh, stuff from that interview, that conversation that uh, stuck, uh, resonated with him and stayed with him. And maybe he's talking about it at cabinet meetings now. Possibly. Or caucus meetings. You never know. I don't you know. never know. I don't but know. You got to have these conversations. Well, uh, you know the whole new uh, three-day voting thing. Vote in any. Yeah. I don't know if that's about an informed vote, but it definitely helps with the ability to vote. Yeah. So it's a movement in the right direction. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And there's also uh, advanced polls as well. Yes. But indeed. The, you know the election day will. So if the election's on a, a Friday, you can start voting on Wednesday. It looks like they want they want the three days, uh, three day voting thing, which probably won't be put in place until the following election, Mm -hmm. if whoever forms the government this time around coming decides to push through with that. Because if we have a change in government, that might fall by the wayside. If the Um, conservatives uh, ascend to power, they will kill that immediately. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but. Yes, uh, the more uh, advanced days and more access to mail-in voting and all that kind of stuff, all important, all important when it comes to getting the vote out. Um, because democracy is something that you do, write those letters, kits and cubs, or ask for a meeting, very important. And I think that's all I have for you today. So from the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager beaver saying, it could be a tough world out there, kits and cubs, so please be kind to and gentle with yourselves and have a beaverific weekend, whatever it is that you have planned. Mr. Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom for the kits and cubs? You know, normally I have something at the ready. Last couple of days I've been kind of struggling with it, and I think one day this week I kind of gave my words of wisdom at the very beginning of the show. <laughs> You did indeed. It happens. You know, uh, as we go into the weekend, try and remember things are bad. Yes, let's acknowledge that. But let's also acknowledge that in many, many ways, things have never been better. I get, yeah, cost of living is up. Groceries are up. It's expensive if you got to fill up your vehicle. It's harder to get to work. But at the same token... 
We will soon have a national pharmacare program that covers every Canadian, a dental care program that will cover every Canadian, you know, outside of those who have something with their employer. We have $10 a day daycare. We have the child tax credit. More children have been lifted out of poverty at any time in history. More water oil advisories have been lifted on Inuit, Inuk and and First Nations communities, Indigenous communities across this country. The only Prime Minister to ever do that. I want you to remember these things when the election does come around. As the old saying goes, are you better off today than you were four or five years ago? Many people will say yes, and Consider- thank you for getting us through the pandemic and keeping Consider- as many of us alive as possible. Exactly. Considering four years ago was 2020, yeah, I am much better off than I was in yeah. 2020. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I think objectively. It saying, objectively, I'd say the vast majority of us are. <laughs> <laughs> please tell me if I'm wrong. Please, please keep asking that question because the answer is pretty damn obvious to me. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, please roll the credits and we'll uh, have a couple of Easter eggs for you when we get back. Excellent day, sir. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. <laughs> Kid Saucy, you better have a nice egg basket for us when Easter rolls around. I expect Speedos. <laughs> Cheeky monkey. Mr. Grizzly, I will let you go first because apparently you have something for us. Yes, I From do. our good friend. From our good friend, Creek Pete, I have a shareable um, video. It's two minutes and 15 seconds. And let's just listen to what our friend has to say. In, in a way, only he's able to say it with... Anger and joy and laughter, all at the same time. Pierre Polyev slams useless corporate lobbyists in Ottawa who should expect no favors from him. Uh Uh-uh, definitely not. (laughs) Definitely not expecting any favors from Pierre Polyev. He is against corporate lobbyists, except Jenny from the block that owns a company. She's technically not a lobbyist. She just owns the company that employs multiple lobbyists for Loblaws while the conservatives are complaining and blaming Trudeau for food prices, right? I mean, it's just, it's, it's a coincidence. It's definitely, but he's no favors from them. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Except the ones that are flocking to his Aww. cash for access fundraisers, because, you know, it's it's all good when they give him money for campaigning even though there's no election, right? No, they're definitely not expecting any kind of favors because, you know, we all know conservatives definitely aren't pro-corporate party, right? Definitely definitely not. No, uh uh-huh. So this is just another coincidence. And then, I mean, oops, oopsie, right? And Jenny from the Block's associates that are lobbyists that were just supposed to be lobbying Ontario stuff, right? That's that was that was the whole thing. It's just Ontario, right? Silly stupids, right? But but the, except except they started their own firm inside of Jenny from the Block's office to to lobby other things federally. I mean, it's it's just I mean, this is shocking information. I mean, who would have who would have thought this stuff? <laughs> Seriously, when are you PP for PM fans gonna realize that like everything that he shits out of his mouth hole is is, is a lie? It's every single thing that he says is a lie. Everything that they stand for is a lie. 
when are you guys going to realize this? Do you think the corporate lobbyists that are flocking to his fundraisers aren't expecting anything? Do you think that he didn't know about these stories coming out and that's why he said that bullshit just so that he can have some sort of cover? Come on. Come on. Are you, are you really falling for this? <laughs> I'm glad you showed that one because he, I, I was actually looking for another story and he actually featured it in it. So I'll be, I'll have it ready for Monday's show <laughs> that I can read it in. And I was like, what was the article? What's the name of that article again? Um, but yeah, yeah, Creek Pete has pretty much nailed it there. Nails it once again, as he always uh, does. Yes. And uh, my little bit is because um, kids have been following my home renovation adventures and they asked uh, yesterday and I didn't see it when it passed by. But uh, the work has already stalled mm. because they removed a couple of um, siding um, and uh, panels and Fan noticed cantos. that was th there was something, yes, underneath it. Um, it seems that when we lifted one of the siding panels, we had looked on one of the parts of the house that I guess was an addition. And it seemed that we had wood paneling and we thought that we had wood paneling under all the shingles or whatever you call them the siding pieces mm -hmm. and it turns out that on the original part of the house that was not the case they're not covered in wood shingles they have some other type of tiley thing that um, could possibly quite likely most very much assuredly probably is asbestos Toast. yes so they've had to take a little uh, piece in to Belleville to get it tested when we're praying to God that it doesn't have, there's a level of asbestos that if it's under that, then the people mm -hmm. who do the siding can remove it themselves. Otherwise we have to hire a whole bunch of other people to and do it. And that's expensive. And that's going to be extremely expensive. So um, how, how old maybe, is the maybe that studio is going to be delayed. <laughs> how old is the house? Uh probably close to 70 years. I mean, it was built oh, World yeah. War II, right? That's probably asbestos. I'm sorry, buddy. I'm just, that's probably what it is. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, and 40s you know and what 50s, the, they used it you, a lot. You know what, where it was like two days before the guy showed up, we were actually discussing whether or not, you know, maybe we should just not do the siding thing and just mm. like consider the heat pump because the heat pump will get us to like the amount of emissions that we need mm -hmm. to get the bonuses. And well, we decided, had we not pulled off one of those things and noticed there was asbestos under it, we'd be golden. But now that we know. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, one of the so, ways of remediation was not removal. They would spray it with a sealant. So that mm -hmm. way it would not be friable. I've taken courses on this. I don't know. It's been a while since I've, I have to take an update because it's been a while. Uh, but I don't work anywhere around it anymore. So do I need the update? I'd like to have it anyway, just so I have the knowledge because knowledge is power. But the question I have is, is, uh, is the sealant still viable? I don't know. I think, mm -hmm. I think current legislation requires, uh, re requires total removal. I could be wrong. Yeah. But there was a time where you could seal it because if it's yeah. not friable, which and friable means that it flakes off and things get in the air. If it's not doing that, they can seal it and then insulate over that but yeah don't, don't quote it, me on that it's doing that as they're pulling the panels off so it's, you it's know, friable it, it's cracking yeah, in certain yeah. places so yeah, it'll have yeah to it, all, it all has to come so yeah. yes that is uh, going to be expensive and that's probably many more vacations now that we will not be taking and well uh, it should have been in in uh, disclosure when you in the uh, when you purchase the home they should be able to tell you whether they, or not. not not if they don't know yeah, the people who owned the house before us didn't own it for that very that that long, and the siding okay. was already up before, so there was no way to know. So yes, we do have. And there's to, no uh, requirement to check. Right? Yes, uh, we uh, we own Miss Shattuca, so uh, yeah, we're going to probably have to remove. We're going to try to see if there's any grant money for remediation. I don't think there is anymore, but hopefully there is. And uh, but yeah, um, that's going to cost us a bit, and it's an amount that we did not plan. And welcome to the money pit. That's what everybody told us when you buy a house. But yes, uh, we wanted to make it more energy efficient, and it turns out that it's going to uh, be a bit of a be a bit of an issue. So uh, yes, um, 
the the money that we were going to use to pour the concrete pad underneath what would be the future studio mm. might have to wait a couple of extra years. Oh well, was it, it was the thing? Uh, what's the? Uh, there was a comedian years ago who did a bit about how, you know, post hurricane or tornado when people's houses are destroyed. They always interview the person who just lost their home and they're always weepy. It's like, I want to see them interview the guy who goes, oh, I'm renting. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, really? We want to see that interview. Oh my God, you just lost everything. That's all insured and it's a rental, so I don't care. Well, so you think, well, we were about to put $150,000 of renovations into this thing, so <laughs> yeah, good chance we didn't just do that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Check into grant money, though. There might be something available for uh, yeah. asbestos removal and remediation. I, I know people who do that for a living. Um, it's not a living. I, the money's good. The money is good. It's difficult work, and most of the uh, individuals who do the actual removal work don't stop. Don't take breaks and don't stop for lunch because you, the way it works, if anybody wants to know, I can give you a quick breakdown if you're interested. They have to have a clean tent and a dirty tent and a wash station. So the order is you, you go into the dirty tent, you remove all your stuff, strip yeah. naked, get into the wash station, then go into the yeah. clean tent and get dressed. Yeah. That can take 40 minutes. Then yeah. you take a 30 minute lunch and then get suited up again and go back in. Most of them don't bother to take breaks or lunch. It's yeah. just not worth it. It takes too much time. And they're like, no, nah, just screw it. They have a really huge breakfast and then work their day through. Yeah. So yeah, that's going to be going on at our place. So uh, yeah, I'm um, a little bummed out. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, mm. but it has to be done. Yeah. So, and we are we are unfortunately the poor suckers who decided to pull the siding off. So we win the prize. <laughs> <laughs> Not the prize one wants, but nevertheless, the prize one gets, right? Yes. Yes, indeed. Yes, Michelle Kago says, maybe someone who does asbestos removal will be watching this program or someone who knows someone who can help at a much lower cost. Yes, please. That would be Yeah, great. I know lots of people who do it, but only in Ottawa. I don't know anybody who does it in, in uh, K-Town area. So, yes. uh, Send your shekels and doubloons. <laughs> <laughs> well, All right. Uh, before we set another record for the longest Easter egg ever, <laughs> Mr. Chrisley. I let's end the show. <laughs> okay, we can do that. We can do that. All right. We'll have a uh, beaverific weekend, everyone. Some of us may see some of you this evening. It remains to be seen. Uh, maybe, maybe James does a, a, a casual Friday. I don't know. Uh, I'll check in with him and see if he's going to do one. And if not, uh, my lady may want to host something for the ladies tonight. So we could, we could. I'm amenable to hosting something for the ladies if James isn't doing one. Yes, or just Eager Beaver After Dark. Eager Beaver, eager beaver After eager, Dark. Eager Beaver Le Soir. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, man. I'll so, see uh, Grizzly, Mr. Grizzly, oh, maybe, yes. help me get, maybe help me get over my uh, uh, asbestos fee woes with another picture of uh, Jake and what's his name? Okay, hang on. Let's see here. I'm, I'm, I'm going to look for one where he's super ripped. Um, let's see. That one. Come oh, to there. my rescue. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Oh, no, it's a video. I don't want the video. I don't want the video. I want the photo. Uh, oh, here's a good one. Yeah, here's a good photo. Hang on. I will just... Uh, oh, no, it's a video. Damn it. I keep getting the videos. I don't want the photo. I want the photo, not the video. Why do they keep giving me... Uh, there we go. That's a photo. Okay, here's one. I think you'll like this, sir. Let me just... Uh, I can't get it to blow up, though. Will it blow up for me? Uh, yes, it does. Excellent. Okay, here we go. Here we go. You'll like this, sir. Sometimes the photos don't blow up, and in this case, it did. This is a scene from, <laughs> from when he's at the fight in the UFC. <sighs> yeah, Jake Tannehill spent some gym time. Lord Hammersy. <laughs> I think there's more. Hang on, hang on. I'll, I'll find you another one. Just a second. I'll find you another I one. I want more. <laughs> <laughs> Count your blessings. One, two, three. I just hate keeping score. Any number is fine with me. As long as it's more. As long as it's more. Or does that sound too greedy? 
Well, That's this is a not video, but no, indeed. This is from a video, but I think he'll. He, there's a still. So I'll show you the still here, and I think you'll like this. All right, getting the fan ready. Oh damn! He's somebody's been drink. Somebody's been, been drinking milk. Yeah. Been, been the <laughs> oh, there we go. There's a better still. Ooh la la. Better still without without a play button. There you go. There you go. There so. you go, kits and cubs. Incontrovertible proof that milk does a body good. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> Woo! Pass me some yogurt and some cheese. Woo! Here we go. <laughs> What's yogurt and cheese gonna do? Dairy, dairy, milk does the body good. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Half an hour Here you go. Here's one. the land. Oh, that's not it. I want this. Oh. Oh. There we go. Here's a photo for you. All right. Hang on. I'll blow this up a bit so you can see it a little bit better. This is the... <laughs> the day goes, his left boob is bigger than his right boob. Yes, but one boob's always bigger. Okay, right? this is strange. I'm reducing everything to make the picture bigger. I don't understand that. Here's another one for you. This is... Uh, he, he's not super ripped, but he's got he's got his shirt open, and he's, this is from the poster. Yeah, I think you'll like this one, too. Uh just casually lounging, mm -hmm. all bruised up. Mm -hmm. You can see he's got a little bit of a stab mark there. Yep. Yeah. Oh, and you know who else appears in the film at the very beginning who? is uh, Post Malone. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, he's at the very beginning of the film, and Post is, uh, so the Gyllenhaal character walks into an underground fight club, and uh, they're like, he goes, well, first... The woman who owns the roadhouse that hires Jake Gyllenhaal walks into an underground fight club looking for a specific person, Carter or something. Where? And they point down. That's him there, the guy with the beard. He's like, he's taking all comers. So he, he goes through seven, six fights, and he's about to take the seventh one. And it's Jake Gyllenhaal's character who gets in the ring, and he just says, nope, I'm out. I'm out. I'm not fighting him. I'm not doing that. So he leaves. So Gyllenhaal's character gets all the money because the guy you know, didn't bother to fight with him. So, Yeah. Uh, it's because he's a well-known uh, former UFC champion in the film who mm -hmm. actually kills a guy in the ring. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. There you go. If it, look, if 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 there's some pretty serious hand-to-hand -hand combat violence in the film, and if that troubles you, don't watch it because the fight scenes are incredibly real-looking. They really look like they were punching each other. Uh, I think they might have used CGI. I don't know. They use different camera techniques. Now, this fight scenes go on a little bit long, like nobody would have enough strength or energy to do that, but they're very realistic looking. And, uh, and if, if, if that's your genre, if you like gung fu or kung fu or gun fu, for that matter, you might like this very much. All right. And that's that. That's Mr. Grizzly's recommendation. Yeah. yeah. Go right. into your Friday with some... Uh, popcorn film. It's a popcorn film. That's what it is. It's not going to make you think. It's just going to make you sit back and enjoy. There you All go. righty. All right. I'll see you. Bye. <laughs>